Well, hello everyone. It is me, the drinker, and wow, that was weird. That intro kind of went weird there, and I feel like it's still playing in my my background speakers somehow. So, yeah, uh, it's like Stre Streamyard likes to do this kind of thing every so often. It's great fun. Uh, but anyway, I am here. The drinker is here, and uh, we are going to be doing a little special kind of VIP lounge tonight because, well. As everyone who watches my channel knows, I appreciate a good war movie, I appreciate a good action movie. Um, but, you know, I am but a normal man, I am just a guy who reviews movies on YouTube. And so, I don't have the background experience uh, to tell you which one is the most accurate, which one is the best, which one uh, gives you your sort of most realistic uh, depiction of war and how it's all done. Um, and so the logical thing to do was to just find a totally hard bastard who knows all about this stuff. And I believe I found the perfect one. The man that's going to be joining me tonight. Uh, he's like a 30-year veteran of the military. He was a Green Beret. Um, and he's then moved into doing all kinds of awesome like shows about Hollywood weapons and movies and stuff. Um, and all kinds of like survival things. So he's an awesome guy. And I'm looking forward to introducing him to, to you guys. So without further ado, I shall bring on Terry Shepard. Hello, man. <laughs> I don't know, man. We can't make eye contact. That's bothering me. I'm just kidding. Man. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there you go. Right, mate. Right. I do have eyes, believe it or not. I do have eyes. You're just, they're just glassy and, and bloodshot. <laughs> yeah. This way I can get as drunk as I want and no one will know. Yes. Yes. That's your job, sir. That's your job. And by the way, let me apologize, too. I... I got a, I, one of my old, I adopt old dogs or cancer patient dogs. I got back here. He's finishing his dinner is fat Larry. He's oh, back. Nice one, man. Yeah. He's a lab bloodhound. And then we have a dog that, uh, I volunteered at the shelter down here at the beach. I live in North Carolina and a bunch of dogs came in from a, uh, <laughs> a rescue that brought 300 dogs on a plane from, from meat factories in South Korea. And, and uh, six of them came to I the am. beach. We got we got one of them so i'll try to keep them from barking but i have no control over these animals they're just they're not uh, trained they're just they're just friends and they own the place but anyway. hold on Good. wait hey, let, let me see if i can let me see if i can do this there you, you got a great back there right yeah yeah that's that's smoky there so um the other one Lara, she's cool. like in a different room <laughs> greyhounds are cool dogs i think you know it's funny because i think people assume that because they're greyhounds that they're just constantly running around crazy all the greyhounds yeah. i've ever met are the biggest couch potatoes, man. They're just chill dogs. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they sleep about 95% of the day, and then they get like these me. crazy bursts of energy where they just run around for, like, five minutes, and then they're done. So, yeah, yeah. they're pretty easy to look after. But they're good fun. You know, we, ado like, adopted these ones. You know, they're ex-racers, and uh, yeah, yeah, those, that's what yeah, happens. Yeah. You know, they finish after, like, four years, and they've still got another 10 years ahead of them, but, uh, you know, they, they've got to find homes, I guess. So, yeah, they, they're... They're good. They put they put in the time. They've earned a nice retirement, and they just you know they got yeah. nothing to prove. What are they? You know. <laughs> nothing to prove. Mm. But yeah, man. So like I, I was always explaining to people there. Um, you are obviously you've had a very extensive career in the military. You know, you started way back in the eighties. Uh, you've been to Ranger yeah. School. You've been in the Green Berets. Um, and you you've served all over the world. So I mean, I guess if you don't mind, could I ask you just like a little bit about how you got started in that and, and how yeah, it all played out yeah. for you? So, yeah, man. So and I'm just by the way, and I'm nothing exceptional in my community. I'm you know, there's we I've walked among giants. There are dudes walking by you in the street. You have no idea how dangerous some of these guys are because they'd walk right by you. But yeah, so I was in college down at University of North Carolina in Wilmington, which is you know, I'm in North Carolina now. But I was. The end of my junior year, I just switched majors to from biology to anthropology. I was I like being in a lab, but I was at a buddy's house and he had a book about uh, Mac V. Sog and special forces in Vietnam. And I was like, hey, man, I knew nothing. I could borrow that. And I took it home. I read it cover to cover. And I was like, you know what it was, uh, Drinker? It wasn't the... Um, it wasn't the stories and the missions and stuff, which were har harrowing and hair raising. And you're like, holy shit, these guys did this. It was for me, it was the black and white pictures of these dudes. And they, they got their, their some of this, some of the pictures were before infill, before they went in. And then some of the pictures were after, and some guys weren't there because they, they just didn't make it out. But these dudes were, you know, they're, they're tiger stripe fatigues. They're, they're, faces are all dirty and camoed and they got their arms around each other, black guys, white guys, mountain yards. And I saw all these big white teeth and I thought these guys are fucking wolves. And, and, and they're, and they're actually 
they're laughing at death. Like they've really faced death and they're smiling about it, you know? And you could also see a lot going on through their eyes of some of the things they had seen and done. I thought, that's what, that's what I want to do. And so I finished college. I was supposed to go to graduate school at Duke to study primates, sir, which by the <laughs> way, in the army, that's pretty much all I, I was around, around primates. So <laughs> yeah, man. So I had a summer off. I lived with my brother up in college in Vermont. And then I enlisted in the army. I didn't, I had a degree, but I didn't want to be an officer. And so I was an infantry guy in the 82nd Airborne, that's like the British paras. And then, yeah. you know, and I had a lot, it was a good place to grow up in the army. Oh, my goal was always, I knew I wanted in special forces, but you had to be in the army back then for a while. So it was a good place, man. I was in a reconnaissance platoon. So we all went to ranger school. There was a recondo course. I was in Panama, not the war. I was there before that. We didn't, and then I went to ranger school and then I was in the Gulf War. And then when I got back from that, I went through special forces selection and I, I made it through that. And I became a Green Beret medic, which is what I always wanted to do. Uh, it worked well with my science background and everything. And uh, yeah, so I was I was in Stuttgart. I uh, fought in Stuttgart for Phil Habiaha, and I was there. This is in the this is in the nineties now. Mm -hmm. I, I enlisted in 1988 when we were still using <laughs> chain mail and crossbows and. <laughs> Dude, all my friends now in the military, they call me a, a like a FUD or a boomer. I'm like, fuck off, man. That's <laughs> I bet some of them are watching because I've turned a lot of these dudes on to you. And a lot of them are already watching you before this. So uh, in any way, so yeah, so I was in for almost nine years and I was like, well, I just didn't see yeah, the Bill Clinton army. We'd done some cool things in, 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 in that unit and in, in Charlie, 1st Battalion, 10th Special Forces. But I didn't see myself doing like 20 plus years. And so I, because I kind of, check the things I wanted to do. Yeah. And then I went, I was like, well, I like doing theater in high school and college. So, okay. So I got out of the army and I went back to New York city where I'm originally from. Don't hate me on that. <laughs> and I went to a theater conservatory circle in the square and uh, like a full-time two year program. And then I was a working actor in Manhattan doing the door at crazy nightclubs, living a vampire existence, going on auditions, did a lot of theater. Um, got to play Macbeth and I choreographed all the fights because I was a martial arts guy and a fencer, blah, blah, blah. And it was, and start little, little TV things like every New York actor has to have the obligatory short stint, short guest uh, appearance on Law and Order. Yeah, and yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I bet the, the UK's probably got that too for different shows where like actors, yeah. you'll see them if they come. Orlando Bloom was in Midsummer Murders, like when he was like, you know, 18 or something. So anyway, and that was going well. And I'd been out of the army for four and a half years, didn't touch a gun because I was in New York City. And then 9-11 happened. And I was like, well, shit. Um, Damn. Do I go on auditions or do I get back in the fight? And I was like, I, I have to get back involved. This is what I did for so long. So I re-enlisted in October of 2001 to the National Guard Green Braves. I guess it's kind of like a territorial SAS, I think, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's National Guard. But we were, but the war started, so we were gone a lot, a lot of deployments. And so then I was still living in the city doing theater and whatever and it, it going on trips and coming back and training with my team and and then i ended up getting my own show on history channel called warriors and the pilot episode was about scotland which i have to tell you about this and then uh, <laughs> so i did that and then i host i did a shark i did shark week in 2010 and uh a survival show it was in the uk it was called survive that um it was a two-year over here it was called dude you're screwed that's a difference dude you're screwed terrible name for a show survive that I think much better. Yeah. And one of my best friends on there is actually a, uh, he was a uh, RAF guy and he runs the, uh, the SEER school. The, he's one of the chief, I think he's the chief SEER instructor. Now he writes their manuals out in uh, Cornwall. So he's a great, great, one of the best guys I've ever met. I, most common guy. So anyway, and then I retired in 2016. Uh, and I end up right around that time, I end up getting a show uh, called Hollywood weapons, which I host now. And it, it's a pretty good melding of, being get to because I always joke around. I go, oh yeah, I know special forces sniper, boring. Oh wait, I get to dress up like Batman. Oh, <laughs> you mean I get to dress like the female vampire Celine and test if you can shoot through a floor? That's fun. So we just you know last summer we filmed season six. Um, we're waiting for that to air. There's been some uh, stuff going on at the network. So uh, yeah, so I'm currently doing that. I also teach diving for a. A veterans charity 
Uh, we teach guys who are with real bad. So we got, we've taught guys how to dive that are, you know, amputees and, and brain injuries. And we've been excavating, uh, we've been working with East Carolina's maritime archaeology people, and we've been excavating a Hellcat wreck that we found in Saipan. And the goal is to take wounded guys, put them on a team again, make them, give them a reason to get up in the morning. And then eventually we'd love to be able to repatriate those reme remains to that family that lost their guys 70 plus years ago using wounded vets. And, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I'm going. So how we met was that season six, Matt Marsden, who you had on your show, and it was a great interview. Yeah, he's, he's such great. a good dude. He's such a good dude. He's a huge man. Have you, can you tell he's a big guy? And I've been I mean, I can only see him like kind of like head and shoulders like we are now, but like I can kind of tell like he's he's pretty big. He's a just a big frame guy. Like next to me, I, I'm I'm about six feet one ninety five, and he looked dwarfed me. But we've been friends for a couple years and uh, communicating. And I was like, Matt, you want to come on the show? He's, there's and we we did a scene. We brought him on to test a scene from uh, his Rambo movie. He's a good shooter too. He knows what he's doing. But after the filming, we were sitting around a fire, and I go, Hey, man. Because Matt's one of us as far as he looks at the world, his views. And I said, have you have you seen The Critical Drinker? Have you watched this dude on YouTube? <laughs> I'm not kidding. And he was like, no. I go, fucking watch it tonight. Watch it tonight. And yeah. so two days, he left the next day on a plane. He texted me a couple days later. He goes, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding me. He was like instant <laughs> fan. And uh, and so then, uh, then a while back, I saw that he was on your show. I was like, hold on a minute. I, he owes me this. <laughs> Matt Marsden, yeah, but anyway, I, I reached out to Matt and I said, do you think, you think he'd be interested in talking to a vet about not really necessarily like what's a good technical movie because there's a lot better guys, I think, than me. Um, you know, I know enough about it, but like what kind of movies really speak to guys like us that, that, that we gravitate to, that we, we habitually watch. If it's on TV, we're going to put everything down and watch it or ones we always come back to or we quote or that we can identify with. And, and so anyway, Ed, you, you were kind enough and gracious enough to, uh, to reach out to me. And, and uh, man, I'm telling you, you, you have been a gateway drug drinker because a, whatever it was a couple years ago, I started watching you. I was like, who is this motherfucker? And then, and then, all of a sudden I stepped, then all of a sudden I started seeing these other people that were on with you, like, you know, Gary from neurotic and Disparu mm. and as and Mahler. And then Chris Gore from film. I was like, there's a whole world of guys like you that um, see things the way I do. And it, I, we don't have to agree with everything. That's not what I want. But but your ability to pick something apart, and it's not just you don't come on and go, oh, uh, that movie sucked. You, you're a writer. You're a talented writer. And you, you, you always – one thing about you, I'm, I'm going to puff you up. You don't need it. But, I mean, like what's great about you is that you don't just critique a movie because, oh, I didn't like this. There's also times you even offered suggestions of how they could have made it better and not ruined it, like you did with Star Wars and stuff like that. And I think that's it's a what you guys are doing is really, and you can tell by your engagement on 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 online. I do feel so sorry for you because you have to watch shit that I won't watch because I just <laughs> watch your review. I watch you and Nerd Roddick about Rings of Power, and I'm like, I'm not because I'm. A, we'll talk about Tolkien, how instrumental that was in in my formation. But like you guys, you guys, you guys are doing the Lord's work, drinker. You might not, you might, you might not it, it think does, about it. It, but it makes me feel good though. Like when when people get in touch and they say, "Look, dude, you've saved me hundreds of dollars in cinema tickets." I, I'm like, "Okay, great. Like it's worth it then." <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're doing a public service, man. And I think actually, I, I mean, I don't know the details about like what you know how you know. I'm not a social media guy. I'm freaking computer it, i mean i know enough as a team sergeant in special forces to do what i do but like I, I think you guys actually have i think you do i think you know this you guys have a lot of influence and um because you're fair you're also very fair you've even i remember some of the reviews you come on like i have to say you know i didn't think this was going to be i have to go ahead and give this a you know a nod and say that's actually a pretty good movie you know and and you you break down why and i think it seems you you <sighs> And cut me off anytime because I'll talk all fucking day. But like, I think that um, <laughs> I think that it's an interesting time right now because we have really there's a weird denial of Western culture. There's a there's a guilt about it. Like, oh, we we have to hate ourselves and uh, all these other things that are going on with 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 the entertainment business. And I think you guys are kind of putting them up against the wall and, and calling their bluff on it. And I think it's 
it's not a small thing. It's actually a pretty, pretty, pretty good service you guys are doing, man. And besides that, funny as shit. <laughs> like, the, like the whole thing about about the message and you yeah. know, like you know, diversified. Le- it's I, I don't. I'm curious how you got into this. Actually, I'm sure you've talked about it maybe before, but like you have a big fan base from people like me and my community and guys that you know, not necessarily necessarily military combat guys, but he, just normal dudes that are like. I told some of my friends I was going to be on your show. They're like, "This is maybe the greatest thing you've gotten into." I'm like, "All right." Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, for a start, it's good to know that the, the military guys are on my side because I don't want to be against them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and well, we're not a monolithic group, you know? We're not a monolithic no, group. No, no, totally. Because, yeah, and also there's – you know, I've, I've gotten some people mad at me before about this. You know, and, I, and again, the UK is uh, similar, I guess, in a way. I, we work, I work with different studs from the UK. In the, in the US, remember, it's a voluntary force. So you're not being drafted. And that, that reflects some of the movies that we can maybe talk about. But you, pay, you, you voluntarily go into the military and then you pick your job. So that whole thing about, well, there I was, had no prospects. Next thing I know, I'm in Vietnam carrying a rifle. That's not happening. I chose infantry knowing what it was going to be. And then I elected to go through the special forces stuff, blah, blah, blah. And so you have guys that there's two different militaries. There's the combat people, and then there's also, and then there's, honestly, there's everybody else. And those are all valid jobs. Those are all good careers. They they have their, I mean, they all have a, a necessary purpose. But but it's not the same thing. Just because when I, someone says, "Oh, he's a vet," I'm like, "Well, what did he do? Was he, you know, was he a gunfighter guy, or was he?" Yeah, I mean, this is this is, I guess, the distinction that you make, and you don't want to disrespect people because it's like, well, any exactly. person that's serving their country because obviously they deserve a degree of respect but i think there's a difference between you know maybe guys who work in like um, infrastructure or admin or whatever and the guys who are actually boots on the ground on deployment in war zones you know like those are yes the guys who and, get... and you know and i think a lot of civilians are understandably maybe reticent to talk bad about them or to even critique them because it's like, well, I didn't do it, so I can't say anything. Well, guys like us, we can say whatever the fuck we want because we, you know, we pick this line of work and we are a different, we are a different breed. It doesn't make us better, but we're definitely different and and it's a different life and, uh, you know, the whole, the stakes are a lot higher. And you could get killed doing anything, right? But I mean, like, if you pick the jobs we are in, you're kind of signing up for a pre- Pretty big risk pool and even just training you know guys guys get killed in training in our world you know because we we push the training we we, we we we're very careful but we're also it's got to be realistic guys can get killed in aircraft accidents there could be considering the kind of the kind of stuff we do in training the realism of it all the stuff at night all the stuff out of aircraft platforms jumping fast roping everything like that i mean it's, we're doing pretty good because there are training accidents and some guys every now and then someone someone has a bad day but in general yeah. it's it's pretty good you know it's pretty good and movies are a big part of our, our of our culture movies and tv are a big part of the military especially comp because we sometimes downrange we have time to watch stuff that's another thing and so like what's the kind of stuff that we like you know and it's not all it doesn't have to be realistic uh hyper realistic because you know for the big thing is and you've spoken of this if it's going to be a good military movie it's got to be a good movie it's got to be a good movie so it's it's it and and to do that you've got to have you've stressed this over and over you've got to have good writing yeah and you've also you know by having writing is when you can do things like character arcs and development and stories so you know just having the sexy guns and stuff like that that's kind of boring to me you know a good movie is a good movie if it happens to be a military movie that can can talk about some of the stuff that matters to us, and uh, I really do want to talk about one of your last videos about the destruction of like a sort of the male archetypes and and how those male archetypes are the things that we really do value in the in the military because it's performance driven. It's not histrionics or emotion. I mean, I'm an emotional guy. I think you know I'm I I, I get that from my mother, but <laughs> I have to be able to you know put that aside and go to work when i have to so yeah man well i mean I, this is the i guess the kind of thing i wanted to ask you about because you know coming from that military background and i'm just guessing here but um a lot of the stuff that you get put through in training it's there to test your ability to perform under pressure it's there to toughen you up it's there to put yeah. you through that because if you can't handle someone yelling at you 
like on a parade ground or something how the hell are you going to handle people shooting at you and throwing grenades at yeah. you and right you know you there seems to be this real push now that like well you can't put people under that kind of pressure you know we have to be like you know aware of people's feelings and we don't want to offend anyone and i just thought that's not the kind of society that's going to breed people that can go into the military because they're just not, they're not going to be able to cope with that kind of environment and even if you soften up the training for them to try and make it more acceptable what the hell is that doing when they actually get into a real war and people are actually shooting back at them like that's you're that not seems yeah yeah crazy. you're not no, you're not. It's, it's actually destructive and it's suicidal and it's actually negligent because you're not doing anybody any favors by making it easy. And, you know, it kind of reflects society as well, too. And in, in, in our whole thing, you know, I went through basic and 80 and basic training is not hard. It was I mean, it sucked because you had to get up early and get yelled at. And but I was, you know, I was a high school and college football player, small college. So I was I was used to getting crushed by coaches and a physical life. And being yelled at and being, you know, the whole team paying for like somebody's mistake. That's all part of it. Yeah. But I did see that a lot of kids were not. And I was older. You know, I had graduated from college. So I, I wasn't like a 17 year old kid. I was like 22 or three, I think, when I went in. And uh, you could see a lot. of Some some kids were, 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 were overwhelmed. They had not been. You could tell they had not maybe played violent team sports or they had not spent a lot of time outside. Side story on this. I've talked to some recruiters, and this is a big thing right now. So this is in the 80s, 88 I went in. Kids now, a lot of the young people now, they're, they're actually breaking femurs from putting heavy rucksacks on their back and just walking through like you know rough terrain because they're not physical. They haven't been physical their whole life. And yeah. so they have, and it's, they have, they're, they're, they're significantly softer, and a lot of them do cave under being under stress. And you know, you're, it's supposed to be a crucible uh and base like i said basic isn't hard infantry was more is just like a you know a suck fest special forces we select guys that we put them under very interesting and difficult mental and physical challenges because we want to select for a guy who is resilient and um i say i'm problem solving that's I, I, people say what's a green beret I, well i just say we're problem solvers and and that's another male thing that seems to be wanting to be erased by film and TV and popular culture is that we're not those kind of people. And we are those kind of people. And that's sometimes to our detriment. I mean, as a guy, when you're with a woman and, and you, whether you're married or have a girlfriend and something's wrong, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to fix it. You want to, okay, let's yeah. fix it. And this so, this and, is and, this is one of the really interesting things that like I eventually learned. It's like sometimes you know when your wife or your girlfriend's just bitching at you about the bad day she's had or whatever. Like you say, your instinct is like, okay, tell me what happened, what went wrong. Let's try and find a solution. Eventually, you realize they don't actually want a solution. They just want to have someone listen to them complain. And it's just, I think that's a brilliant example of like that fundamental difference between men and women. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's not that we don't care or anything, but it's like, well, we're we're there to try and like fix things or get things back on track, rather than just be like, oh, okay, that really sucks for you. I'm so sorry about that. I'm being empathetic. It just doesn't come very naturally, you know. No, and that's always I... a source of tension. But it's just like that's how we're different, you know. That's how we approach things differently. We're just, we are wired differently and, you know, not, and biologically different, obviously. No, I also, can't say that now, my friend. That's how, illegal. Yeah, how dare you? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> the boss girls would argue, you know, that's, dude, what, like, like I, I remember, man, you were talking about, I think it was that awful, which again, thank you for what you do because you have saved me so much time. Like you did a, a review of the Charlie Angels movie and you're like, really? Oh God, yeah. Really, you're gonna you're gonna just whip up on three. What do you say? Cooperative, I think cooperative stuntmen or something yeah, like that. Yeah, extremely you know? accommodating stuntmen. Accommodating, accommodating. Yeah. But we are different, and and so you know that's that's the thing that I, in your other video when you're talking about like wanting to beat that out of the male population, feel free to try, but I just don't think you can. And it's not about tough guy chest pounding stuff because that's 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 kind of boring and stupid too because we are. We're not, we, we are, we are a, a, I don't know, what's the word I want to use, man? A matrix of different things. We, we have bad days and we can be emotional creatures, but like, you know, we are, we are, we want to fix, we want to take the world and manipulate it and to, and to form it into something that we think is better and, and more effective for whatever that goal is, survival or, uh, you know, 
whatever it might be, prosperity, whatever. And so that's kind of that's kind of what we are. And when you start trying to get and it's and by the way, and there's a spectrum of guys. Some guys are not like that at all. Some guys are uber that way. You know, like I'm a terrible handyman. I didn't grow up knowing how to do any of that stuff because like, it wasn't my dad's thing. So I don't know. I do like to, I can blow shit up and I can shoot guns and I was, you know, I can do that kind of stuff, but I'm not, I'm really shitty. If it would come to remodeling this house, I would be kind of worthless, but um, we do have different, different roles. And I think in the military, what, you know, I want to see is I want to see them get that right. Cause it isn't about the guns or the, or the, or the tech, even the techniques and the tactics and stuff like that. If it's egregiously bad, I'm like, but if it's, I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, that's that's not the right magazine. That's come, shut up, dude. It's a movie. But <laughs> the, the biggest thing is if you get the people right, because I think you know we can all identify. It's hard to identify what kind of person you are, but there's been so many different movies I've seen and television shows where I'm like, I know that guy. Oh, I was with that dude, and I I, I used to get in a fight with that guy. And so that's the thing when they when they get that right. Uh, that's what makes it very interesting. I mean, the military stuff on top of it, because it's such a heightened, right? The stakes are pretty high in the combat military. If you fail, you you might not come back or you could be grievously injured. Or one thing that used to keep me awake at night as a special forces medic was, do I know, am I good enough? Like, do I, am I good enough, man? Do I know what I need to know if I have to, my friend's face get blown up and I got to stick a cryco do a cricothyroidotomy and get a tube into his eye and I'd be like, oh, and so, but, you know, what that does, it can paralyze you, but then you're like, all right, let's, we got to train on this. And, you know, and as a team sergeant, I used to have to identify on the team, like, what are we good at? What do we suck at? And what's the stuff we're going to have to do down the road? Like, what's this mission coming up? Well, we probably need to get good at maybe indirect weapons or we have to do something like this. So, all right, let's get, let's get, let's get, because you never, there's not enough days not enough hours in the day to get great at everything all the time. You're constantly chasing that ideal of what you need to be for whatever that mission profile is. So, and it's a lot of pressure and peer pressure is a good thing too. I think you've talked about this before. Um, peer pressure is not necessarily a bad thing because in the military, especially like in the infantry and special forces and stuff like that, not, <laughs> not wanting to be the last guy on the run or not wanting to be the, the worst shooter on the team or the weak link. We've talked that, about that. Yeah, that's the way that's I described big, it. it. It's yeah, like, I think this, for, for most guys, that's the thing. Like, uh, this is what I see in TV shows and movies all the time these days. Like, guys complaining all the time about, like, oh, this is this pack's so heavy and, like, oh, I'm so uncomfortable or, like, this is going to, like, blow out my knee or something. Like, real guys don't talk like that because they, they don't want to be that weak link in the chain and it's not like a macho thing it's just it doesn't come naturally to complain about stuff that nobody can help you with it'd be different if i don't know you say you're hiking through the mountains and like one guy go like twists his ankle or something like and he has to say like i can't keep going i'm gonna have to turn back right. or whatever that's a problem that has to be addressed but if it's just i feel tired or i'm cold or i'm wet or something nobody can help you with that so guys wouldn't complain about it at least none of the guys that I know would do that. Uh, but that's what we're being told that guys should be like now. And it's just, it doesn't ring true. It just feels like some pampered Hollywood screenwriter that's never faced any kind of discomfort in their lives trying yeah. to equate what men actually act like. And it's so fake. It's so hollow. Um, and but not then only guys, can... Go ahead. Well, young guys see it and they think, well, that's, I guess, what I'm supposed to act like. You know, guys who don't get any role models and who don't, you know, we're older, so I guess we, we've grown up with a different generation. Like, obviously, I've not yeah. had your kind of experiences, but, you know, I, I still had, like, a dad who was, like, a, a very much an older generation. Old um, school. Yeah, I kind of got things done his way and all that stuff, and that's what influenced me. But that that's fine for me, but then the, the, the younger generation that's just coming up, uh, they don't have that. And so they see stuff like this and they think, well, I guess that's how guys act now. And then you get a generation of guys who can't cope with problems. They can't cope with adversity. They can't cope with discomfort. Uh, and it just not it only sucks. do we not, not, not only do we not want to be the dude who's no, listen, don't get me wrong. Soldiers and we love to bitch. Oh, we're masters at it. But there's a difference between bitching and whining, honestly. Yeah. And 
Yeah, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, not only do we not want to be that way, we don't really have a lot of patience for people who are. Yeah. And, and and so that's it's not something. And again, I'm taking this straight from your video. We don't aspire to be that way because there is that whole stoicism thing and being able to get shit done when it's miserable, get shit done. And that's another part of our training is deprivation. You know, you, you, you are going to know if you do what I did for a living, you're going to know what it's like to be really hungry. You're going to know what it's like to be really tired and, and you're going to know what it's going to be. You know what? You're going to know what it's like to be really cold and, or really hot and really miserable and depleted. And so, like you said, if, if you can do that kind of stuff in a training environment, if you have to live through that down the road in the real world, it's not the first time you've been there. So it's like, okay, I've been, I've been this cold before I've been really hungry. I've been sleep deprived. And so, yeah, we want to do by design. The training is supposed to be that way. I will tell you uh, something that might, and again, I, I can't speak for the UK, but I suspect we're, we're pretty close, man. I think in a lot of cultural norms and sort of the way we look at stuff. Mm. Um, I work down, I have a contract job. I work down at the special, it's the Q course, it's the qualification course. And I work down at the uh, four or five times a year. We, there's the, the, the final exercise that all the dudes have to get to get their green beret. Up to this exercise, they've all, if you're a medic, you've gone through all the medical training, which is like two years. You've all gone through combat patrolling and all these other different aspects of your job. But then the final exercise is a big gr simulated guerrilla warfare thing called, yeah, I'm about to turn on lights too. I'm, I'm sitting here, the beach is behind me. Like the ocean's right behind me, man. And the sun well, is going I'm down. just, I'm looking at myself. It's like, I look like a dead man. It's like, you've, you've got like a tan going on and stuff. And I'm like, God damn, you can tell it's winter in Scotland. It's like, I've just lost everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but um, what was I talking about? I just forgot. Yeah, my yeah. Um, the, the training that you go through. Yeah, so, so that's, I mean, it's supposed to be hard for a reason. And then, and then, you know, and you ramp that up and, and, and that way it's not the first time. And, and, and again, Oh, so when I'm, when I'm working at that course, you know, so I'm, I'm out in the woods with these guys for two weeks and, and I'm a role player on this lane. You know, I play a, uh, I don't want to talk too much about it actually, but I, it's kind of, a, I get to be a role player, but it's sort of an instructor in role in a way, sort of, I can kind of, and I will tell you that it's it does my heart good every time I leave there after those two weeks. Yeah, I'm out there and all that. And you know, it's, sometimes it's cold or wet, whatever. But it, it, it rejuvenates me because I do see a lot of young guys that have decided to not buy into the bullshit, that are not going to stay home, constantly get high, watch Netflix and complain about the world. They've actually picked up the sword and they want to be challenged. They want – that's another male thing is that we want to be, I think – at a base level and it doesn't have to be combat but i think ch being challenged and overcoming that is the thing that, that i see a lot of these young cats they're they're i I'm, i look at them i joke around with them too because some of them recognize me from my tv shows but they don't we don't i don't break character when i'm talking to them but at the end i can introduce myself and and uh, i say hey guys my name is terry shepherd i'm i'm a d-list cable celebrity and i'm kind of a big deal here so you're welcome and then they all <laughs> and then i go and later on i'm 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 kind of hoping I get to run my hands through some of your hair because, God, you guys got a head of hair. And I don't have any. <laughs> Everyone has a good it's laugh. Like a trip at my down memory expense. lane, you know. <laughs> Everybody has a good laugh at my expense, and uh, but it's it's good because I, there are dudes, there are men in your in your culture over there, in your society, and in our in my society now that are not they're not they're not going to accept this. They're going to find ways to challenge themselves and to and to do something you know, greater than, you know, than, than sort of just making money for themselves. I, I think, uh, yeah, like there's, there's a thing, particularly when, when you're young as a guy where you've just got this like boundless energy and you need to direct it towards something. All right. And I think, you know, for some guys it's, they direct it towards their career and it, it might be about like, you know, advancing and making money. Other guys, they might challenge themselves physically. They get into sports, that sort of thing. But the problem comes in when the, some guys who just don't do it and they don't find a thing that can that can occupy them, they don't have a, an outlet for all that energy, and then it just turns negative. And that's when the guys get into, well, they either get into drinking, they get into drugs, they get into crime, 
or they just lay about and do fuck all with their lives That's and exactly like, right. get more and more angry and frustrated and bitter about like how they don't do, they don't have anything going on that's when it becomes a problem but that's the thing like so much of what modern culture is now doesn't offer them anything to get their teeth into it's about no you know playing it safe it's about not taking risks it's about not like uh being too aggressive or too ambitious or like threatening or anything like that and it's just like creating a generation of people who don't have anything to aspire to and that's that's what pisses me off and like i know like f the things i do reviewing movies and stuff it's just a tiny little part of it like the the entertainment that we watch but it, it has an influence and it reflects yes. where we're at as a culture it reflects what yeah. we value and it reflects what we want to instill in people uh and the things we're instilling in them right now are awful like they're they're so counterproductive they're counterintuitive but it's like what some idiot somewhere has decided we have to tell people and that's that's where we're stuck and that's where a lot of my channel comes from. It's where a lot of yeah. my motivation for doing what I do comes from. I just think it, it puts out terrible messages to people, you know? Well, I, I think I, the thing is, you're not just, and again, I, I really do mean this. What, what was fun, what was great about your show and illuminating to me was, yeah, okay, there's, there's other people who are film critics, but really what you've become, man, is a sort of a, an observer about society and about culture and about because culture is learned behavior. That's another thing. They always make it about race. It's not about that. It's the culture. It's how you're brought up and how you view the world, what your survival strategy is, what matters to you and what you're going to do to get that. Um, and so that's that's why I think so, that's why you're, you and some of the other guys I mentioned are, are actually have a pretty big piece of this because it's not just reviewing a movie. It's an observation about because those movies reflect the powers that be what they think and then what they want you to think. And, and that's the thing we, we the pushback on that. I think it's coming. I, I feel like this last year was a bit of a nice uh, punch in the teeth to some of them. I don't think it's complete yet because the only yeah. way to, beat, the only way to beat, you're not going to reason with them. The only thing you're going to do to, to, to really take a hunk out of this and to start maybe turn is to starve them. And you do that by not getting them rich. And so I, gr I get it. You know, you pick your battles, you can, you know, you, you got to do something. He's got to get some stuff. But like, I just refuse generally to like, I won't watch the NFL anymore. I was a football was a formative thing for my life. But when I watched them, when they watched Drew Brees, who was a, I don't know if you know the game, but he was a, a, a very talented quarterback for the new Orleans saints. Apparently the, I mean, the NFL made him wear on his helmet, the name Jacob Blake, who was a convicted sex offender who was coming to, he was threatening his, his, uh, he has his girlfriend who had his baby. He'd already done a lot of bad things to her. He was coming over to hurt her. So she calls up the cops. They come, they get in with him. He pulls a knife and he gets shot. He mm. doesn't die, but he gets shot. This was in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kenosha, Wisconsin burned because of this. Our vice president, Kamala Harris, flew there to Wisconsin to tell him that she was proud of him. She ne never went to the funeral of a, 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 a cause he, she's a, she was a Senator from, from California. She never went to the funeral of a Sikh police officer who was killed by illegal aliens. No, no representative from California went to that funeral, but she went there and thanked him and said he was great. Drew Brees is having to wear his name on the back of his helmet because the NFL made him do it, I guess. And then he also had, he, then he also talked about, you know, the white privilege of his grandfather who fought in World War II. And I was like, you just destroyed yourself for what? For these. So I don't watch NFL. And it's not like, uh, I just don't want to do it because and it, so much could pivot. I think in a, it could pivot on a dime if they started losing money, really losing money. That's the only thing that's going to stop them. You're not going to convince them of the, of the error of their ways. You're not going to logically beat them. These guys are operating in fake constructs that don't use logic you have to take away their revenue stream and so it bothered me like uh, a while back when they fired gina carano i never saw the mandalorian i'm not a star wars guy but i know who she is from mma mm. and she was a piece of that show she basically had innocuous tweets and you know the, her other cast members are left-wing bomb throwers they never got in trouble they fire her but people are online saying oh that's effed up and how and then in the next couple days later they're tweeting about can't wait to see the new marvel thing dude what do, what do you actually stand for i mean like all you have yeah. to do 
all you have to do is not if you if you stop giving them money, they would have to reevaluate. So that's what bothers me about a lot of this culture stuff. I get it. You know, like you, you want to take your kids to Disney and stuff like that. So it's it's not an easy black or white thing, but some people just seem to just be worried about. I think it's by design. We have a domesticated population that cares about being well fed, medicated, comfortable, and entertained. And and okay, if that's what if that's what you care about, I'm like, well, I don't want okay, but but just understand nothing's gonna change. You know, it's not gonna change. Yeah. I mean, I think from the football side of things, like I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert in American politics, but like it just really feels like sport in general should not be a political arena. Like they shouldn't be making political yeah. statements they shouldn't be like supporting this cause or that cause or whatever that's outside the realm of what you're supposed to be doing there it's supposed to be a, a sportsman like competition amongst teams that's all it should be it's not a pl it's not a platform for no. you know, political beliefs and so and the, yeah and yeah. the nhl the national hockey league which is a pretty up until now seemed to be a pretty good bastion of like we're not buying into this shit put out like tweets about saying that, you know, trans women are women. And I, I'm like, how's the, why is the NHL talking about this? And the, uh, the ironic thing is that the people who are pushing these policies in the NFL or the NHL or other sports things, they don't even really give a crap about football or hockey. Like they're not even, they were never probably fans in the first place that they're their social media uh, engagers or influencers. And so it's interesting that these organizations are being destroyed by people who are in charge of them that really don't give a shit about that. And they never cared because they used to hate jocks until jocks became, you know, social justice people. And then all of a sudden football players are worth listening to up till then they were just, you know, dumb jocks that made their money by hitting people. Yeah. It's just funny. Yeah. So it's like, they, they kind of get to have it both ways. And I just think I'd like to see more, people picking and choosing some of their battles and that might really make them listen because you're not going to convince them. I, I, I mean, think uh, from the movie side of things, because you kind of touched on this earlier, um, the idea that like in the past year, it, the tide may be starting to turn. And I think that's the case. Like I think they've had so many movies flop. They've had so yeah. many TV shows that have just gone nowhere that fans have rebelled against. Uh, I think they've finally started to take notice. Like, the problem is, like, things don't move that quickly in Hollywood yeah. because you, you, you're seeing movies coming out now that were commissioned, like, three or four years ago. It's a process, obviously, of, like, yeah. scripting, shooting, editing, all that stuff. It takes a long time. Uh, and so you don't see the changes immediately, but you start to perceive that, that change in direction. And, like, we've noticed it with things like Warner Brothers, who basically ran out of money because they've had flop after flop. And so they had all these movies that were going to be coming out that were going to be woke and that were going to have like race, gender swap characters, all that stuff. And they, they've come in and they've taken a scythe to all of that and said, no, nope, we're not even doing this. This is this is cancelled. That's cancelled. We're cancelling this project that's in, in flight. Uh, and I think it's going to happen to the other studios as well. It might take a bit longer because they've yeah, got a bit more okay. money behind them. Disney's obviously got a lot of money behind them from their theme parks, but even they will eventually get there. And yeah, it's just yeah, a that's, that, that's, how, that's how it's done. I mean, I, again, I'm not trying to sit there and judge people who like who just want to watch the game or just want to take their kids to Disney World. I, I, like I said, you have to pick battles, and sometimes you have to be all right. I get it, but but I mean, I think you know. There's a bit of a I think if people wake up and realize that the people that are that are giving you these products, they, they disdain you. They actually they openly yeah. disdain you and they expect and up till now you have just taken it because you just you want to be entertained. I just want to watch a TV show. Well, maybe just don't watch it for if, if you just shut down that stuff, then they would be like they would panic because they like you said, all these and some of your guys, some of your reviews, like the She Hulk stuff. You know, uh, I, I, didn't, you know and uh, I, didn't, I didn't have to watch. I probably wouldn't have watched it anyway. But like you guys did yeoman's work because it was like watching you guys talk about that. Watching you talk about Rings of Power. Watching you guys talk about Willow. Yeah. And just recently, this, I just saw you do something about uh, the, the Scooby Doo stuff too, which you know I grew up on that cartoon. Oh my! It's yeah. so it's so funny. It's so funny. 
some of that stuff, like legit, it was just I, I can't even be angry about it because it's so dumb and it's so inept. Like it's just like we can just sit back and laugh at it. And She Hulk was like that. Velma's like that. Because oh. everyone so kind of universally agrees that they're shit. I think the things that like annoyed us more were like back in the day when you had the Last Jedi come out and that sort of thing, where people were still trying to keep up the pretense that it was good. Um, that was a different situation. But yeah, it, 2022 was like the year of rebellion against this stuff. That's when you had like the Rings of Power come out, and everyone, if you're gonna fuck with people, do not fuck with grr tolkien fans because they are embedded like they are hardcore uh yeah and like they they saw this they knew what was coming and it came out and sure enough it was exactly as bad as they predicted and they just absolutely went apeshit and i loved it it was fun it was great to see it was heartening to see because that was a fan base that had seen what had been done to star wars they'd seen what had been done to star trek and they said nah fuck you you're not doing that to r.i.p uh, and they, yeah. they just, yeah, they, they absolutely savaged it, and rightly so, because it was garbage. Well, Tolkien, you know, and Tolkien was, you know, Lord of the Rings, I, I read the Lord of the Rings in, like, I think, eighth grade or seventh grade, and I, I still have those books next to my bed. Many times I'll just pick it up and just, thump, boom, and I'll start reading there. It doesn't even matter which one. I mean, it's one book, technically, but, you know, and it was that was a formative thing for me, uh, because I, I realized that, you know, when I was, I grew, I'm Catholic and I, 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 by the way, I wanted to be a Franciscan when I was young, clearly took a wrong turn at Albuquerque. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't end up being a Franciscan, but I, I, I considered that. And I, and I, you know, and I, um, I, I just, so, so what was great about that. And the reason Tolkien, I think, especially was a bad thing for them to fuck with, you know, Star Wars wasn't, didn't have a literary, uh, um, backdrop a literary canon that, that was created by an incredibly erudite and smart guy and so but but lord of the rings was when i was reading that when i was a young young kid and then it, even as a young man i was like there's good and there's evil there's like there's cooperation between races that maybe didn't like each other or had grievances in the past there is an overarching theme of like one great power controlling everything is bad that's why Gandalf could have taken the ring. Galadriel could have taken the ring. I yeah. mean, and so, but they knew that he even said, he, and Aragorn could have taken it, you know, but they're like, no, I know what this is. All those things, it's ironic that so many of the, you know, sort of left wing quote Tolkien people have clearly missed the point of J.R.R. Tolkien's writing about faith and sacrifice. That's another thing, too. Like all those characters at some point in that story did something heroic, unbelievably heroic. I mean, so you could argue, I think, cogently that like Sam Gamgee was like the greatest hero in the show because he oh, in the book. Sam, Sam was the v the MVP of that show. Yeah, he just yes. uh, and, yeah. And, 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 yeah, here's a dude you expected nothing from and without him and without any and the thing is too, without any of their contributions to the cause, Mary and Pippin meeting the Ents and bringing them into the into the fold. Like all those things were so important. And and also the the way he developed that world, it made anthropological, physical sense of how that was how that was done and so the reason that peter jackson so the uh, lord of the rings um uh, the fellowship of the ring came out right pretty shortly after 9 11 and i had just re-enlisted i was i was getting some train up stuff going back through a medical thing to get plussed up on my skills and i was down in the tampa area and i went to go see the fellowship of the ring and at the end of it i actually i had my eyes were watering i stood up and i was clapping because I thought to myself, son of a bitch, he got this right. Because the yeah. thing with Jackson was it was clearly – and they made different – there were some things that are not in the book and he had to make decisions for cinematic purposes. And that was all fine. I may not even agree with some of them. Like Aragorn, by the way, some of that – Aragorn was not denying his power. He was always knew he was going to be the king. But they, But the point is – that was clearly a film made by somebody and a team that actually loved that work and did not want to deconstruct it or to view it, as you say, with a modern audience. And it's like, <laughs> you know what I'm like, like, that's why, dude, I laugh at your shit so much. But like, that's why those films were so great. It was also genius to film all three of them contiguously. So like they're, they're in New Zealand for like two years. And so you don't, cause you know how that would go. If they filmed one, like 
hey, get Vigo on the line. We got to get him another contract for this next. Yeah, it's like they were, yeah. Suddenly it's like 10 times as expensive. It's yeah. not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So and it was done with love. And in an interview with him, he even says, he goes, we did not want to put our political, uh, our political spin on it. We wanted to do it in Tolkien and clearly That's with the- such a good video like it's Gary that found that and like I, I just I love to see it because it's such a brilliant like um, indictment of what we have nowadays where everyone yeah, has you guys like- all what was great about the run up to the rings of power which again I won't watch I have Amazon Prime won't watch it I got you guys I had I had you guys uh suck it so that I could actually you know re- but you guys predicted it like before it happened like you and Gary and others were like just the things you were hearing and some of the stuff you guys called it. It was so it was so great to watch that, and and the the the, the pushback. And again, they were fan baiting because they if you didn't like it, well, you didn't like strong female characters. Bullshit. Uh, if yeah. you didn't like, it, you're a racist. Bullshit. And it was just, but they tried to do that kind of stuff because they knew that they had no love or understanding of that material. And it's, it was good to see them get their ass handed to them. That was really a success. That was, that was, that was maybe the, I think the biggest success story in the film, in the, in the entertainment world was that failure and guys like you covering it and not just predicting it, but covering it along the way. It was just like, it was pretty glorious, man. It was pretty glorious. It was good to see. It was great to see the fan base rally around and just uh, reject it. And I think they know, like, uh, you know, I've spoken to Gary. He's, he's, shared with me things from like amazon executives where they're straight up shitting themselves because they know Good. this wasn't a, a hit and they're like oh god damn we've got a billion dollars invested in this what do we do and you know that's why they're already talking about like well we're going to stick more close to the canon in the next season and we're going to have more battles and stuff in it and it's like they know they fucked up they can't properly admit to it but they know yeah and you know it's 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 richly deserved because a guy like peter jackson he understood it. He put the work in. He produced something really great, a great adaptation that everyone loves to this day. You know, me and all the other guys, we can we can do a live stream talking about like Two Towers or the Return of the King and just amazing. gosh over it. Yeah, it's and amazing. I, I I I rebought. I actually had the you know the the DVD or Blu-ray disc extended version. I've worn it. I mean, I've worn it out where it's, it was it was like skipping because that's how much I watch these different ones. And I just got a new set the other day delivered. I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to get another one because you know what? You can't have it enough. And it's it's my kind of go-to. It's almost become a comfort food for me um, that I can watch and enjoy. And even if it deviates from the books in some ways, it, not not in a major way, and they got so much right. And and again, there's the, the messages in there too for the military are, are those kind of things. I mean, there is – There's a stoicism in that where like, you know, think of the suffering that that some of those characters went through and they just took it. Think of the sacrifice. Those guys sacrificed themselves for each other, you know, and and it's it was just it was just it was so, so well done. And it was as I said, I'll never forget clapping in that movie theater with tears in my eyes because I was such a Tolkien fan. I was like, oh, thank God they didn't jack this up, you know. Yeah. because it was clearly done by someone. It was it was a project. It was a labor of love. Rings of Power was a labor of money. And it was a labor of, I don't know what the fuck it was, but it wasn't a labor of love for sure. And it was not done by people who appreciate him. And that's the thing, you know, this isn't some, you know, he created the world. He created a language. He created so much about it. And so it, it's, you can't fool people with that you can try you can maybe lie about other stuff like stars it was all made up anyway there was no like literary body of work that that they took it from it borrows from all sorts of hero like joseph campbell the hero of the thousand faces i mean these are these are mythology things that are common themes again that are important you know the the young guy who has to face adversity find out who he is and then you know do the right thing and and all that that's these are these are lessons we've been teaching each other since we were you know, throwing sticks at each other and hunting, hunting uh, wild animals and doing cave paintings and stuff. These are all human themes, and that's 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 why it was so. That was that's why that stuff was so good. And when you when you get away from that because of your you know modern sensibilities, it's gonna it, you suck. You know, it's just not gonna work, man. It's not gonna work. And you know, most of my most of my boys in the military they love the Lord of the Rings because it's again it's a story of sacrifice and 
and a common purpose in fighting a, a, an overarching enemy. It's funny that so many of the left wing people who love the Lord of the Rings totally missed the message that they, these are the same people who want a huge government telling you what to do. That's kind of like. <laughs> yeah. so, you're, so you're actually sort of saying you love Lord of the Rings, but you're you're actually you're a fan of Sauron. You believe in his message, which is to overarching control of everything. And, and centralized yeah. power for everybody. Like, well, I, I maintain of- always that, uh, you know, in the books, because they, they kind of omitted this from the movies, which I understand cause for pacing issues, but the scouring of the Shire, uh, they make a lot oh, of references. Oh, that's what my favorite chapter happens in that. It's, yeah, that's, that's clearly a reference to that kind of post-war communism like attitude that was going around because there's references to like oh they they told us that all the food was going to be distributed equally to everyone but like nobody ever saw any of it and i was like that's just the fucking soviet union man like that's right, that's perfect. all that is come, yeah they came back to that and you know another you know tolkien also that's a man who i don't care if you like him or not that's a man who lived his life i mean he fought in the great war he saw yeah. the meat grinder of trench warfare and that absolutely informed what he was. And I, I, I thought, I mean, I will cry every time I watch Lord of the Rings at certain parts. I will absolutely cry at Boromir's death. Absolutely. I will actually just, I'll be like, but it's a good, it's a good cry. It's a like, yes, this was a, this was a sacrifice. And then in the books, as well as the movie, the idea that, and this is something that speaks to, 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 I think veterans stuff. And, and I've seen it in different movies in some different ways. Like, coming back home after all that shit there's a great scene it's a and they did it in the film pretty well they're all just sort of uh sitting down in a, in a tavern and they're watching all the rest of the hobbits polish pumpkins and have a good time and like nothing's they they didn't miss a beat really and these guys have come back and seen all this death and all this suffering and have gone through the incredible trials and they just sort of look at each other and raise their mugs and tap them like we know and then the yeah. idea that Frodo could not come back, he was the Shire's been saved, but not for me. And I think that's so, so, so poignant. And I love when Gandalf says, he goes, I will not, you know, I will not tell you uh, not to weep. I will not say don't weep because not all tears are an evil. It's like, it was so good. It was just, it, it, it just, I don't know. That, I got goosebumps talking about it. That That's a, that not only is that a, a work of art, uh, literature wise, but cinematically, they just got that so well. And it, it, again, it, it, yeah, it tied into a Tolkien's life and his and his worldview and his his understanding of good and evil and sacrifice. And it, you know, sometimes to save something, the people who do the saving really can't they can't really partake in it anymore because it's that's lost to them. And I, I feel that way about us too when we come back. I don't mean, oh, uh, woe is me, but it's different when you come back. You look at things a little bit differently, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. And we got guys, these are, you'll see guys like us wearing these bracelets. These are dudes who didn't come back, you know? And, and again, it, it, it's, it is what it is, but there's a sadness to it, but there's also a beautiful, I probably can't articulate it right. It's just, it's just in some ways, man, I've, I've been so privileged that I got through that training that I was in that society because it really is a warrior society. And that I was, I got to be a part of that. And it was, it took a lot out of me. I lost my marriage and I don't have kids. So I get to die at a VA hospital as an old man with no, <laughs> just plugged up with tubes, like, fuck off. You weren't there. But it's <laughs> it, like, we've given, we give up a lot, you know, we give up a lot and it was, it was worth it. That's why sometimes when we see one on the country, it's, I'm not saying you have to be rah, rah, right wing, but I mean, like, to just sort of spit on that sort of sacrifice kind of hurts a little bit. I, I, hey, man, I you know for those people, I think to myself, I didn't do it. Uh, I didn't do it for them. We did it for each other. You know, I, I remember one time a few years ago we had gone to a wedding. A friend of mine, I won't say his name, he's one of the best dudes I've ever met. So talented, smart, dangerous. He married a, a girl from Greenwich, Connecticut, which is a very wealthy part of the United States. And uh, I'd never met, I'd never met his wife or his family, but a bunch of it. He said, could we come and we, I want you to wear your dress uniforms. So we're like, yeah, okay, man, sure. So we show up, you know, barrel chested freedom fighters with our berets and our dress uniform. And, and we walk into this, we walk into this place and I'm not joking. You could hear this. <gasps> like, I don't think they'd ever, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think they'd ever seen God. And we're just looking at each other like, it's just us. But they're like, you could see them like, they had never seen a bunch of dudes like that 
walk. They just never dealt with us before like that. And then one person asked me too, because I'm, I'm old, you know, I retired when I was right around 50. I'm 57 now. And I remember they were asking me like, why do you still do this? And I was like, my one word answer really probably shocked them. I said, love. We love each other. We love the country we do. We love our families, but really we love each other. And what, and when I say love, it's not an emotional thing. This kind of gets back to your point about some of the stuff you've really eloquently talked about. You know, for us, love is not emotion. It's a choice. It's a decision, right? So it's like, it's an agreement. So like we put our hands in the middle, like, Hey man, everybody on that objective is going to die, but none of us, we're not going to, no, we're not, no, no one's going to get left. Behind. We are there for each other. And you may not even sometimes like some of these guys. There's guys I didn't get along with, we different personalities, but we still loved each other because we were, what kind of work, what kind of job, I got to say my workplace, my place of work, when I would walk into a team room at the company, everybody in there would be, everybody in there will kill for me. Everybody in there will die for me. Consequently, everybody in there expects me to kill for them and maybe to die for them. And so there's that can't be replicated. And so, yeah, I get to do cool shit. I film a TV show and I do charity work and I rescue senior dogs, but nothing will ever. Nothing can replace that. Nothing can actually take that place. You just have to say, man, I'm what a gift that I got to know all these guys. I was just in a play here. I auditioned on a lark. So I was a theater guy. So back in September, I auditioned for, there's a theater here on the beach called Theater of Dare. Pretty cool theater. And I got the lead role in, the, in a play. And I was going to be gone for the month working down at Fort Bragg in the Woods. I said, I'll be off book. But I came and the play was a huge success. But one of my best friends, one of the most dangerous men I've ever met, but also one of the kindest men I've ever met. That's the paradox of us. He flew up from Florida. He got a plane. He flew up from Florida to, to Norfolk, drove down to the Outer Banks, watched the show, and flew back the next day. And after the show, Damn. all we did was hug. We just kind of hugged and kind of almost cried. He was like, man, I'm so – he goes, dude, it's so good to see you doing this again. And that's the thing. And it's, you don't have to be a soldier to get this. I think we're a different bunch, but I think most men and, – and women too. But, I mean, like, it's kind of a universe. these are universal themes of, like – making it not about you and making it about how can I help this other, how can I help these cats? Cause we all have bad days down range, man. And I've had, I've had guys give me a hand up. I've been there for them. I had a conversation the other night, a friend of mine texted me, he goes, I'm not doing good. He had some survivor's guilt about something. I was on the phone with him for like an hour and a half. And at the end of it, you know, what we said, we told each other, we loved each other. And I said, I'll, t I'll, I'll be checking up on you. And I think those are lessons that we can take into civilian society as well. It doesn't have to be at the point of a, of a sword or at the end of a gun barrel. I think those kind of things. And that's why when good films can touch on that, that's the magic. That's when you're like, fuck, that's a good movie. And it's not because yeah. oh, I got the guns right. It's because they understand that, that deeper experience of sacrifice and suffering, mutual suffering, actually. Well, this, I guess this is what I wanted to touch on um, with this stuff. You know, the, you've talked a little bit about, you know, when movies get this right, not so much with the, the guns and the technical aspects of it, but just getting the, the camaraderie of soldiers who go into That's everything. war zones like this. Like, is there ones that stood out for you that you just thought, yeah, they got it right there. They really nailed that one. 100%. So it's ironically, man, I have not, and I, I don't think it hasn't, I was thinking about this because I was thinking about what we were going to talk about. And I was like, fuck, man, what, what are we going to, what, you know, like, because I haven't seen a lot of modern ones about the, you know, global war on terror that I've been involved in. I haven't really watched a lot of them only because maybe I'm, I'm concerned that they might suck or they might, I don't know. And if it's, I've seen some, but like, and some of the ones I've seen are not great. And some of the ones I think are, they're, they're pretty good. But like one of the most profound ex war experience films was, would be Band of Brothers. And the yeah. reason why is, well, you know, there's a pride because I was a paratrooper before I was a Green Beret and I was in the 82nd. Those guys were 101st. But the reason that was so good, they got all the other stuff. They got the stuff right. I mean, to include flying in C-47 cargo planes and the equipment and the guns and, and the whole time period was, was was they did that right. But the main thing I think that was important was it you learned you got to you got to give a shit about those guys. And the, what was great about that long form multiple episodes 
was that you actually got attached to them. And you would every you'd see the next episode and go, oh man, I I hope, I hope, I hope that that guy makes it. Or that you know what I mean? You were nervous yeah. because you're like you because in the real world, you you know, it's you don't know who's gonna get zapped. You don't know who's well, gonna you, get the yeah, I mean you off. could you could be the best soldier in the world. You could still get taken out by a sniper just like that. And you know, you get, it could yeah, be bad luck. You artillery, know? artillery shell lands on top of you and you're just you're just a you're just, you know, you're done. You're just scattered all over the place. And so that was a great that was a great cinematic experience because I also <laughs> what's cool is like it's I think it's easier to identify guys that you were with as opposed to identifying like, oh, that was me. It's easier to do that. So like there was so many of those guys in that in easy company. I was like, I know that guy. Oh, I fucking know that guy. I definitely yeah. did that guy. you know what I mean? And so you became invested in them. And what was great about it too was again the camaraderie and the music was so great. Like everything was 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 done was done right, and it wasn't glorified. And like you know, so, some of the older war movies, they didn't really want to touch about. They didn't want to talk about that, like the real the the, the tough side of like the, the 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 death side of it. So that's why like Band of Brothers was really great because from from the opening frame to the end of that of that series. You got you got attached to them and you gave a shit about them and their stories were important. Their backgrounds were important. How they how they sometimes didn't get along with each other was amazing. Sometimes and how some guys that might not start out liking each other were like brothers and best friends. And that's that's a real that's the real military experience, because that's one thing about the military. Again, I some of it's changing, sadly. But it generally, especially in the combat world, it's pretty much a, a uh, it's it's a it's a it's a it's I just I just the word just but it's 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 based on performance, right? So it's not based on what you look like or or your background. So you know you can take a dude who was raised in the mountains of Appalachia, and here he is getting crushed alongside some dude from Detroit, some black kid from Detroit, and they may not even initially like each other, but by by crushing them. And having them work together to, to get through something, that's how that's how society changes. That's how racism gets gets destroyed. Not by some shithead on, on TV yelling at me, calling me a racist, or some pundit saying blah, blah, blah. You get rid of racism by living next to each other and and experiencing stuff with them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And and I think that's why Band of Brothers was so good, man. You know, I, you know, as a paratrooper too. And I just that was I was so attached to those guys, and when one of them didn't make it, or one of I was like, uh, I know, you know what I mean? Like that was really that was really a, a real achievement. I think. What did you think about it? Do you like it? Band of Brothers was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I can't speak to the you know the the authenticity because I wasn't there. Uh, you know, I'm not in the military. Yeah, I wasn't either. Right. It, yeah. it just it felt very matter of fact. It felt very um, you know like. The, it, things weren't over dramatized. Like if someone got their leg blown off by a landmine or whatever, That's it was just shit that happens in combat, and it's like people just dealt with it and moved on. But I think what was great, uh, particularly at the end of it, you know, that there's the really harrowing scenes where they they come across a concentration camp and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of it as well, you get like an epilogue for each of the characters and what they did after the war and how they they put their lives back together. Some of them were able to move on from it others were really like affected by it and i thought it was great it was just a really um a way of humanizing them and a way of just really uh bringing home the the real life impact of this stuff the fact that like, was... the war ends but it's not like it doesn't end for the people necessarily who were fought who fought in it like it can go on for a long time after that what uh, was genius and... too in those every episode start off with they were interviewing the guys and they're yeah. old men and they're old men. And that one guy was talking about how cold he was in Bastogne and how he was in like bed with his wife. And she's like, it's so cold. And he goes, yeah, but I'm, it's not Bastogne. Yeah. And even some, some of the interviews too, you could see, you could see these guys holding back the emotion about what they, what they went through. So you see these old men who they were there and that's now all of a sudden cut, and now you're the, the dramatization and, and 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 what happened on that day at, at Carentan or or whatever, and it was such a great, from a point of view of like a, a cinema or movie, what a way to tie it in where like the 
these are the guys who did it now. These are the old men now that are still here. And that, now all of a sudden they're back and you have these young actors playing them. And it was just done, you know, and, you know, you don't need to embellish that. You don't need to, you know, throw in the allegory. Tolkien hated allegory. He hated allegory. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, he hated, oh, he hated it. He hated There's great that. letters from him where he's talking about how he, he, he absolutely hates it. And it's like, yeah, it's just like the laziest form of storytelling, you know. And I totally it get is. it. Like, yeah, you don't need to you don't need to frame that for a modern audience with the message. It is what it is. And I think that's why it was really such a powerful, powerful experience. I'll never get tired of that. I'll never get tired of that. I think they got again, I wasn't in World War II. I can only, you know, real world, I can speak to what I've done in these few years, but that whole idea of what it was like to, you know, and when they were even in the beginning, when they were just getting their asses kicked in training, running up that hill, the uh Kurahi. I was like, I get that. <laughs> That's what they do to you. They try to, they crush you. They crush you as a group. And that mutual suffering is what really builds cohesion. That's why families, groups of people who suffer together uh, are better for it. Well, the, there's the, the kind of implication in Band of Brothers as well that I can't remember his name, but it was like played by um, the dude who was in Friends. Um, but oh like yeah, David was, like, Schwimmer. Yeah. David Schwimmer, yeah. Like he was a super tough, like, you know, trainer on them, like putting them through absolute shit, like almost like sadistic. But like, the, yeah. there's a kind of implication that, like, well, that training that he gave them, like, actually really made the difference when it came to being in combat. Because uh, without that, they might not have been prepped for it. They might not have been ready for it. But he put them through so much unnecessary shit that was over and above their training that it actually got them ready for what they were going to face in combat. Well, and by him being their enemy, they now had a common enemy in training to, 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 they had to actually overcome this asshole. And yeah, I don't, think, I don't, I don't think he was do. I don't think his character was doing that with that in mind. I think he was a jerk. I think he was insecure. Like he tried to fry winters and tell him that, you know, just take it. And he's like, no, go ahead and court martial me. And he was, yeah, he was, I love that bit. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, was, he was like, no, go ahead and court martial me. It's okay. And you can see him going, Dick, what are you doing? He's like, no, go ahead. Go, you should do that then if that's what you think you need to do. And so he had to back down because he knew that he was in the wrong because it was a, an ego thing. Even people like that. I mean, I've had, you know, I've had guys that I didn't get along with. And I've generally been very lucky in my in my career. Uh, I've had really good leaders. I, I hope that, you know, I could say that they helped me to become a better leader as, as examples. But sometimes even a shitty leader can actually it depends. It can actually bring a unit together because it's like, fuck that guy. Yeah. <laughs> now, if, they're, if they're making tactical decisions and they're bad, well, that's a problem. But sometimes it's good to have a dude like that who everybody hates because it bonds everybody else together. <laughs> it just is what it yeah. is. It's such an interesting thing. Like the, I guess the dynamics of a team working together, like what does it take to, to, to make them gel? Because you're often going to get, I guess, a whole bunch of different personalities that don't work together all that well what can you do to like make them fit and the together? only way to do that the way to effectively do that is to strip away everything as i remember in in, in full metal jacket too and when, when lee ermy was he's like i don't care if you're black whatever he goes you are here you are all equally worthless yeah. and it's like yeah i mean because that's really what it is like that's where that's where modern society is is making a big mistake because they're saying that that ethnic group you're in, that sexual orientation you're in, that worldview, that's the most important thing about you. And that is what defines you. And that's how society should be, should be led and, 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 and gone. And that's, the, that's actually the least important thing about yeah. you, really. It's the least important thing. So that's why, you know, a, a, an elite unit is, are, is a group that has trained together over and over, over again, but that has suffered together mutual suffering is what actually really built cohesion because without that mutual suffering, it's just a job. It's when you actually, when things are really shitty and you know, everyone's get like I said, it's everybody's going to have bad days. Everyone's have good days. But like when you get a group of guys through that, now you've got, now you've got a force to be reckoned with because all that other shit's not important. Here's another thing too. And I have to watch myself because now I'm in the civilian world. So like, if people could be in a team room with a bunch of green berets or somewhere like with an infantry platoon or a squad, they would, they would be like, Oh my God, these dudes are the worst racists, sexist, it just jerks because we insult each other 
just mercilessly because the thing is because again political correctness is a it's a it's a construct it's an artificial construct right that's that done so people can feel good about themselves and it's usually not even implemented by people who are affected by it so like there is no political correctness in a combat unit because we don't give a shit what you look like so therefore oh my god the shit we say to each other it, people would be like you would lose your job for that but in our world it's like well yeah of course i'm going to say that about him and he's going to come right back at it with me i think and, that's and, and, it's a thing with guys yeah. especially like we take the piss yes. out of each other because it's just what you do and like if you didn't do it that's a sign that you don't like someone because that's you know right. they're like the kind of outsider that you don't trust with that sort of thing yeah uh, but that's yeah, again it's something that people yeah. don't recognize uh, and it's seen as like well you can't make fun of this particular person or that particular person because they belong to a protected group. And you think, well, all that does is just drive a big old wall of division between you and them because you're saying, like, no, they're protected. You can't criticize them or you can't, like, have fun with them in any way. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, it's such, it misses it, the but point. It's, but it's, but it's, it's, it's funny. A funny story. Here's a funny story. So, this archaeo so you know here i am doing now fast forward from my college years and now i'm doing underwater archaeology so i'm back to doing anthropology with a group of special forces veterans and a, a university right the grad students and but now archaeologists are a bit different they're not gender studies majors archaeologists get dirty they live in field conditions and also the things they do it's quantifiable and measurable right you can it's not it's not theory that you make up. It's actual. Hey, we're taking this. This is how deep this was. Now there's interpretation, but it is a science, right? And th with interpretation, so the archaeology people are a pretty good bunch. Even the guys and girls, they're 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 pretty. They're used to living rough and and talking a lot of smack. But the first time we had gone out with them, we'd met them. One of my friends, Johnny Glenn, otherwise known as Johnny Motherfucking Glenn, the retired bar. <laughs> That's Johnny, how I want to introduce myself from now on. I'm the yeah, critical Johnny motherfucking Glenn. drinker. <laughs> yeah, he's a retired warrant officer, and he's a black dude, and he's a le dude. Everybody knows him. He's a legendary. He's a, such a well-respected dude in our community. Johnny Glenn and I weren't even thinking. We're all in this meeting, and, and Johnny Glenn and I are trading racial kind of insults, not over, but just like back and forth because yeah. that's that's what we do. And I looked over. Uh, Will and I saw one of the grad students like this. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, I said, Johnny, I gotta fix this. So I, I, I actually got up. I, I actually said, we gotta fix this right now. So I went up in front of him. I said, Listen, <laughs> first of all, you guys are anthropology people, so you are living right now with this, but with us, and look at us as a as a different culture, right? So it's a different culture. This is a culture that maybe you don't have experience in. I said, we insult each other mercilessly because we've been through the crucible together and because we love each other. Believe it or not, the shit that we say is because we really care about each other and, and political correctness is fake for us. I said, we will try to tone it down if it offends you, but just understand that what you're seeing here, look at it as, and also for us, I told him this too. I said, look, for us to recover these remains from someone in our community, even though he died 70 years ago, I, I said, pretend you're actually on a dig in Guatemala and the Mayans that you are with, the Guatemalans are, you're looking at it from a purely objective scientific point of view. For us, this is personal. We want to bring this guy back. So for us, look at us as a bunch of Mayans that you're working with on a dig and how what we're excavating is actually part of our culture and who we care about. And they're like, mm -hmm. They got it. They're like, yeah, you're right. I said, so it's just a different culture. But I to see her face, bro, it was just great because she was just like, you could just see the shock. Like, you cannot say that shit at a university. Well, but that's we the talk thing. Like like that these, these are people right. that have grown up in the most sheltered environment imaginable, like a U.S. college like or university. It's got to be the most protected place you could ever think of. And it's like, I don't know, man, like I'm old enough to remember when universities is like especially over here in the uk they're kind of about preparing you for going out into like the real world and they're meant to like give you like they're meant to teach you shit that you can carry forward in your career your life whatever it is like it's meant to give you career experience and life experience all at the same time and it's meant to be that's good. good that's good and 
But it's not like that now. And now it's about creating a safe space for everyone. And so that doesn't prepare anyone for the real world because they're going to get out there and they're going to start hearing, you know, things that are, might be slightly offensive to their sensibilities <laughs> and they're just not going to be able to cope with it. You know, whereas yeah. anyone else can just shrug it off and be like, yeah, this is fine. So, you know, that's how people deal with things. Um, and, and that's the real loss. That That takes away the value of what all that stuff is supposed to be. You know, yeah. and it's, we it's actually just, hold in, we, yeah, we hold in high esteem. Someone who can trade barbed insults at the turn of a dime. That's, 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 that's a talent. Like, so we yeah. actually respect, <laughs> we respect, if you can insult me in a, just, just take the piss out of me. I, I look at you and go, all right. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Like we, we actually, that's, that's actually, that's actually a character trait that we, that we dig. And so, you know, I have to kind of temper that now in my, in my world out here, because that's not the, but you know, that girl, that girl who was sort of shocked, she was actually very nice, you know? And I think once I explained it to them, everything was cool. And you know, we've never, we've gone out there multiple times with, 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 uh, with East Carolina and they're all great people. They're really cool. Like I said, it's a different kind of science they're, they're used to living in the field and working on top of each other and being sweaty and dirty. And, you know, like I said, it's a quantifiable, measurable result. And so that's a big difference between something like a gender studies person, which it's all just made up shit that has no scientific backing. What about Hollywood though? Like, so, I mean, I guess in your career and particularly post-military, you've had various dealings with like people in movies, TV shows, that sort of thing. Like, how do they take this sort of stuff and how do they handle it? I think, I think again, I, you, I've had to, you know, so I've had some really great people come as guests on the show. We, we tested uh, Quigley down under and um, Tom Selleck was a guest. Uh, we had uh, Gary Sinise cause we tested uh, a, a movie he was in called reindeer games. I, I mean, it was the, the gun test was cool. Shooting a shotgun through six inches of ice underwater, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, Nick Cersei, you should talk to Nick Cersei cause he's pretty funny. He was, um, he played uh, he played the uh, Timothy Oliphant's boss in Justify. Nick is Nick is a oh, okay. Nick is a conservative dude. He doesn't give a shit. And uh, but also <laughs> Bill, Bill Duke, Bill Duke, the guy the guy who played Mac in uh, Oh in Mac a, from Predator. Predator. Oh, I love Bill Duke. He just looks he like was, a hard bastard. Like I wouldn't want to mess with Bill you, Duke. Was, and I and I and I and I before I met him, I, I I looked him up, and I and his politics are different than mine. But can I tell you, he was so gracious and nice. And, 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 and we both respect, I, I, he was also, I think, flattered that I, that I knew that he had directed a really great movie. He had a chance called A Rage in Harlem. He directed that. He's actually a, a heck of a, he was a director too. And we just got along, we got along great. I mean, you know, Tom Selleck is obviously a con conservative guy, uh, but everybody, and I've met people that were maybe not so much, but everybody's been cool to me, you know, cause we really don't really talk too much about the politics piece of it. Cause we're doing the show. I think uh, I think there's more people. I don't know what Marsden told you. I forget because I, I didn't see the whole thing. But there's people. There's quite a few people who feel the way we do. But they're the problem is that they're they're easily you know run over by the people who are kind of making making the calls and kind of running stuff. Because Hollywood is basically yeah. it's, Hollywood's just a big circle jerk. They're living in a they're living in a in a confined space where they think that what they're talking about is is important or on the forefront of people's and it's it's, it's really only for them it's not really yeah. that so that will that might change eventually and i think again trying to convince them is a waste of time just make it so that like the products that they're putting out that are full of crap they just they lose they lose big time money they're like okay just don't just don't eat but yeah i think there's a lot of people that are more and what and it's not about even right wing or left wing but i think there's so there's more people in that world that First of all, you just want to work. It's hard. I mean, I get it. It's you know, if you if you want to be in that industry, you could be a vocal, you know, Second Amendment person, but they might not hire you. So a lot of them just kind of have to operate, you know, kind of keep that to themselves. And maybe that'll that'll change. I sure hope it does. Because again, that just tamps down creativity. If you if you keep the creativity in a in, in a walled enclosure you're not going to be creative anymore because you're just, you know, you're limiting the way you think and the way you adapt. And, and I think that's, they don't really know that yet, but I think they're maybe starting to figure that out as we, as we talked about a little while ago. Well, I mean, it's something that like myself and, you know, Gary Moore, other people have commented on. It's like, it feels like movies are built now based on certain rules about, 
you know, mm. how certain people have to behave, like who can win certain situations and all that right. stuff. And it's like once you understand the rules and you see them played out again and again, it takes away any kind of interest that you have in a film because you know exactly how things are going to play out. Based yeah, on I walk away from scene. it. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's just so you know. I've described it as like the death of art because that's kind of what it feels like. It's once you're you're producing entertainment or art uh, by by a set of rules, it's just like it's you're like done. a computer program. Yeah, like you're not producing anything that anyone wants to engage with because it takes away all the tension. And yeah, man, it's just it's such a loss. It's such a, a waste. And I think what's happened too in a lot of in a lot of the situation too, there's a lot of failed creatives in decision making uh, posts. I've seen this even in some of the other networks like History and and Discovery and stuff like that. Some of these people, I have stories, but there's some of these people fail up, and then they be and so like they're they're basically not particularly creative, but they they get to these positions of maybe being like supervising, a, being a producer. And they're just terrible. They just they gum up the works because a they're not creative, and then they're just putting what they think is their they want to put their spin on what you're doing, and that can be frustrating. I mean, but again, I've been lucky. I met a lot of nice people in the industry that are pretty cool. I mean, I like I said, I, I suspect some of them have different politics than me, but you know, the human story and the human condition uh, should transcend that. For them, it doesn't, and that's the problem. So like. It, that's that stuff should kind of be secondary to like these big themes of sacrifice and 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 stoicism and, and suffering and doing the right thing that that should all the politics should be secondary to that but they've really made politics their religion and 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 they're just they're just putting out shit because you just you said it, it is the death of art you're actually limiting what you're doing based on some you know sort of official ideology I think well, yeah, I've heard it described as like it's like religion without a god. Basically, your god is like social. And, oh, it's a religion for sure. Yeah, it's a religion. For sure, they have high priests. They have, they have their, uh, you know, they have their certain rules. They have their sacraments. They have everything. <laughs> so it it is a religion. Make no mistake. You know, it's just not one that's based on anything higher than what they believe in their gratification or their their worldly their worldly interests, and that's not just boring, but it's also not artistic. Like when you, when you go back and you see like cathedrals and, and some of the sculpture and the paintings from these dumb primitive people from the middle ages, really? Like that's, that's an, that's a level of art that we aren't even, we've gone away from, we've actually regressed. And I think yeah. in our artistic, and you can look at that in our architecture in what we consider art. It's all, because the because the artists now are making it about them, they're not making it about the, the this 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 sort of universal truth of like this beauty. It's really about them and what they think, and that's just I think that's some of it might be okay, but it's kind of self limiting, and it's just not that interesting to me. Well, I I think uh, this is the key difference, isn't it? Because people talk about this whole like art is political thing, and they point to things like I don't know. Say, like, because I'm a big Star Trek fan, or at least I used to be, and I got turned off by the present-day incarnations of it because it. It, it's it's all about just, like, reflecting present-day social issues. And, you know, the, the argument that people try to give you is, well, Star Trek was always political. It was always about progressive politics. And I would counter that by saying, yeah, but the, the politics that the original Star Trek... TV shows and movies talked about were universal ideas. They were they were yes. things about you know accepting other people, about like uh, you know putting aside our petty differences, about uh, religion, you know, uh, economic systems, all that stuff, and moving beyond that to to advance out into the cosmos and explore the galaxy. That's all great stuff about human advancement. Uh, now it's about like we're going to literally push like current day political issues on you in this like with this really thin layer of like fiction on top of it that's not the same thing and it's the kind of thing that's going to be dated about a year after it comes out and nobody's going to recognize it that's the difference you can watch like star trek the next generation or the original series there'll be things in there that still inform you about like life and and society yeah. that are like genuinely interesting and get you thinking about things from a different point of view. You That's did, what it's meant did, to do. Yeah, you did a show a while back, and it was absolute gold. You were talking about Star Trek, and you compared 
you compared Kirk and his responses to like about when when Spock when Spock died and how he was like watching this happen and he couldn't do anything for his yeah. friend and then his speech about how he's and you just dude it was so great man you're like how he's a this guy's a captain of a starship he's not a petulant child that can just feel like he can just let go of his let loose with his emotions because well that's what I'm feeling no he's the captain and so that that sort of understated pulled in thing where like he was talking about you know Spock being the most human his voice was breaking but he didn't break and then that and then you also talked about he is getting into the thing with Spock about what we should do about the, the Klingons you know like fuck them crush them you know and Spock's like well wait a minute maybe we should think that and again what your 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 take was these are two guys who are first of all they have a mutual respect but they clearly see the thing differently but they're pro they're they're prosecuting their in they're, they're 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 getting their point across to each other and it might be heated and it might be you know kind of kind of kind of going at it but they're actually and you can't can see both of them you can see what spot yeah you know he's kind of right and what you say kirk like i get why he's being like and then you contrast with that with all the mo i haven't watched modern star trek stuff about how they're just they're, they they sound like high school kids flipping out and you're, you're like you're supposed, that's, supposed yeah, to that's be this exactly command the like. enterprise yeah uh, yeah like that that's the difference and that's what i respect so much about these older movies it's like yes. they they portray starship captains as you would portray a military officer a guy who's expected to be in control of himself and his emotions um and do his job yeah. that's that's what he's there for he's there to lead people he's not there to cry and and whine every time something goes wrong because that's that's not what you want in a leader like if you're on the bridge of a starship and your captain's fucking crying uh yeah you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna have problems you know yeah you're uh, responsible you're responsible for the welfare of everybody on that vessel so you know and again like you know that was that, that they were that's that's the thing when, when when if you behave like a child you've lost your command and authority really i mean you've you've yeah master and commander was a good movie about that you know like that was that was you know there's there's a lot of different movies along the way where you see see guys that are in a leadership response in a leadership position that clearly could easily could easily just let it rip man just like oh ah, there was, there's some great no but that's the great thing about that movie there's some great conversations and and yes. ideas put forward there because there's a point where they flog a man for showing disrespect to an officer and it's not because yeah. that crime was particularly bad but it, it starts a slippery slope the, the moment yeah. you allow your crew to start disrespecting the officers it's it's a short stop to a mutiny particularly yeah. on a ship like that and, and <laughs> they they have an argument about that and russell crowe's character straight up says because men must be governed and yeah. we have to do it the hard way here because we're at like the brink of survival you know, yeah, look around. We, you. There's, we're on a deck. There's nowhere to go. You can't just leave. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's an interesting perspective on that kind of thing because you know your instinct might be you can't flog a man just for being a little bit disrespectful. But that's the environment that they're living in, and the the movie doesn't try and tell you that one way or the other is right or wrong. It encourages right. you to think about what's the right pers what's a what's the perspective on this one. That's the Have interesting you seen thing. Hundred percent. Hey, did you see? Uh, I just watched it the other day, and I I, I put it off because I knew it was going to be heavy, and I just wasn't in the mood. But I watched it the other day. Have you seen the new uh, All Quiet on the Western Front? Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. What do you think it. of that? Loved it. Um, fantastic. Yeah. You know, um, obviously, <laughs> you know, when it comes to horrific wars to fight in, I think the First World War has got to be the top of the bunch. Proper grim. Proper grim. Um, and yeah, it just uh, it really delves into the. Not just the, the the conditions on the front line, but like the political stuff that was going on that that brought an end to it ultimately. The fact that the Germans were completely out of options and they had to just sue for peace ultimately. Uh, but then the the bloody minded commanders who wanted to order one last attack just it wouldn't achieve anything. They knew it wouldn't. It was but it for was ego. Just, it was ego. It was pride. It was just we want to finish on a victory, and it's like you're sacrificing thousands of lives for fucking nothing for a few yards was, of, think, of yeah, muddy ground. I think that is a that is a proper, you know, because I, I read somewhere some I forgot I can't I can't attribute the quote. It's not for me. I'm not smart enough. But some 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 writer was talking about how there's no such thing as an anti-war movie in general because there's aspects. Of, but I think I think All Quiet on the Western Front is a is a pretty anti-war movie because I think the problem is at no point did I feel like those guys could do anything 
to improve their lot. Like they were literally just thrown into a meat grinder and, uh, and it was, you know, it was awful. Have you ever read, by the way, uh, have you ever read a storm of steel by Ernst Younger? No, I don't. I haven't read that. You might want to look at that. I have the uh, original German translation, ger translated from the original German, and it's about it was about is about a guy who fought in World War One in in the trenches, and it is just a again matter of factly delivered. And I was like, you know, and that that's that's where Tolkien was, and that was that was that that Great War was like a real meat grinder because now you were combining things like machine guns and mustard gas and just like mechanized just impartial death. The, the problem they had is like they they developed all the technology for defensive warfare like barbed wire machine guns trenches they hadn't developed any of the stuff for offensive things that could break through that so they they hadn't developed like close air cover they hadn't developed tanks yet like either all of that stuff either had to be developed in the war like on the fly or they had to like um improve things that already existed um and it was a slow process and it was like yeah, just the, nobody had fought a war like that before. So it was this horrible imbalance of like massive armies that could defend their territory really well, but they couldn't advance properly. Uh, and so yeah. just you're you're fighting over and over over this blasted like, as, mud as a film too, wilderness as a, as a, of nothing. Yeah, as a movie too. I mean, obviously it was based on the book, uh, but it, as a movie though, it was. I, I mean, like 1917, I thought was really good, but I thought I thought All Quiet was even better. I thought it was better. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was, I mean, I get it. You know, I, I just, the, the, that one really, I mean, they were both great, but like, even just the, like, again, I'm not, I don't make movies, but I mean, like just the way the, the, the way it was shot, the colors, I know Mendez did like a single shot through the whole thing of 1917, which was, was pretty novel. But I, again, just, just the, the, the makeup that they put on him when he was, he had the mud on his face and you see these like blue eyes that are just like looking out, like, you could see you used to see he was just being fractured inside. I mean, and but the and the, there was a couple good moments where they were cooking. There's some levity there too, you know, like they were actually taking looking after each other. That's another thing that uh, good movies, war movies, show that we, you know, we look we we have to look after each other. And you could say it's altruistic, but it's also a survival strategy because that way, you know, you may be the one who needs the looking after. And so, well, you that was kind it of before. It. Like this, I guess this bond of, uh, you know, if if you're down in the field, like I'll I'll get you, you know, like we never leave a man behind, kind of thing. So if you get wounded, like I'll pick you up and carry you back, so that we don't leave you behind. And if if I get wounded, I expect the same from you. And I think yeah. if there's that mutual, like yeah, I'm going to risk my life to save yours, um, attitudes. Yeah, uh, that's the that love. Kind of that's, bond. that's the decision. That's the decision. That's the love. That's the decision because. That's the agreement. It's like a, it's an agreement that you make with each other, and that's love. I think it, it really is. I've I've said that, and people have sometimes looked at me like, "Aren't you supposed to be some like you know, green beret?" I'm like, "Yeah, but we love each other because we we will do that." And it, I miss it. I do miss it. Like, I miss it a lot. You know, it's 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 kind of hard to walk away from because we always say the regiment, <laughs> the regiment will always leave you for a younger man. <laughs> Yeah. Just, <laughs> just gonna, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna outlive your usefulness to the, to the, to the, to the machine because you're just, you know, you're too old and too broken, and you're done. It's time to go out to pasture, and sometimes that's hard to do uh, to sort of recognize your expiration date. But um, yeah, I do miss it. I miss it a lot. I miss the guys. I really do. I mean, like, there's something to be said for you know being in a helicopter at two in the morning, just loaded up with everything, knowing that you're going out of a target. Like that's pretty. Nothing can. Re really recreate that but i miss i miss i miss the time with the guys and i do anything else that's what i miss the most and all the war movies that i like have gotten some of that and you know like i said too like in some of the movies like so you had a great com you had a great conversation a while back i just forgot his name forgive me if, if he's watching this or about alien because alien is one of my favorite movies of all time Oh, that but, was, uh, yeah, Robert Meyer Burnett, I think we were talking about. Yeah, that was it. But, like, and, and I think you and I are sympathetic on this because three of my favorite movies happen to be three of the, I think, best 
horror sci-fi movies and that is alien the thing and event horizon like i love all of them <laughs> hey yes <laughs> i love all of them and you know one thing i, I wanted to tell you ask you guys about you guys talked about a lot of really interesting shit on that. It was like a three hour thing. I've listened to all of it, but like, I think one of the reasons that those movies are even scarier is because it's like Lovecraftian existential horror, because you got to think to yourself, if you're a religious person and you accept that there's a, a, an omnipotent, hopefully benevolent God that created, if it didn't create everything, he, he certainly gave breath to it and watched it go and knew where it would go. That means he created the xenomorph. That means he created the thing. That means he is aware of and maybe even built those awful planes of existence that those people went to in, in Event Horizon. And it's like, oh man, like how that's the that's the scary shit. But like in Aliens was more of an action movie. And from the military point of view, I mean, I, I, some of it's pretty you know tropey and all that. But like you know, the best dude was was Hicks. Hicks was the coolest motherfucker there because like <laughs> yeah. he's the guy. Ought to be like remember they're, they're dropping down the planet and, and and gunny goes somebody wake up hicks here he yeah, is he's just like properly passed there yeah, yeah just, and we, all, and we, all, we all fall asleep on aircraft like and you want to be that kind of cool guy that's like yeah and even he didn't want to be the leader like well that means you're in charge he's like yeah i guess it does yeah yeah i guess that's right so i am and then he he shows ripley what to do and he's just kind of calm he's calm you know under pressure and he's willing to sacrifice so Hicks is like one of my favorite, like, you know, cinematic soldiers, even though it was not real, but it was kind of real. And that that's the kind of guys we, we we aspire to be that kind of guy. You didn't aspire to be like Hudson. <laughs> but Hudson was great, too, because and here's another thing about why that movie was. Yeah, Hudson. But the thing is, we all know a Hudson like we've all known a, a guy like Hudson. But Hudson at the end, he went down swinging. Yeah, and he, he, came, also, he came good. Yeah, he came good. Yeah, and he sure. and he broke there for a bit. He lost his shit, and then, and then he like that was a character arc where he was he went from being like smart ass, confident, and then everything went to shit. And he's like, you know, we just got our asses kicked, and then he ended up being really important. And even even the 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 sort of inexperienced, shitty lieutenant who died with Vasquez. I mean, at the end, he really found internal strength and when they when they yeah. blew themselves up in that in that shaft when the, when the when the creatures were coming that was heroic as fuck and he wasn't a hero at all but he became one i and always so, thought there was like kind of unspoken respect between them in that moment like she acknowledged like yeah you came back to try and save my life that's pretty fucking cool man no did that and by the way that was said without there wasn't any dialogue there wasn't any like you know, heart to heart conversation about, you know, blah, blah. No, they just were in there together. And she looked at him and he looked at her and they both knew they were going to die. And that was a brilliant, that was a really great moment in that movie. And that's, it was again, a different movie. Aliens was obviously different than, than alien, but again, that kind of idea that you may, you may have a bad moment and you may, you can still, you can still turn it around. He turned it around. He, well, he went from being like a, a liability to like, you know, a hero. Mauler and I have, have talked about this before, and we've, we've used this as a reference point, where it's like guys like Hudson or Gorman have better character arcs than most actual main characters in movies now. You know? 100%. 100%. Just these like, minor right. characters, you know? <laughs> it's weird. 100% right. And, you know, when they're, when they're, when they're, and that's another thing, too, when they're like, when, when they yell at you for like, well, you don't like strong women, I'm like, I love Ripley. Ripley was yeah, amazing. Yeah. Exactly. Ripley was Everyone great. Vasquez Ripley was, as well. She was awesome. Vasquez was awesome. Vasquez was awesome. And so, like, that's 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 that's, that's again, that's a way of fan baiting because they know they have a weak product and they're just going to be like, "Oh, you don't like women?" Well, no, that's not true. I, I love I love Ellen Ripley. I thought she was a great character. There's a you know thrust into a position that no one wanted to be in, and she actually she got through it. So yeah, that discussion when you guys were talking about Alien, I was like, "Oh man, this is so good because it's it's so right." And I love the thing. Like, like McCready was so great. Like, you know, like that, that, that they, they end up shooting that guy and the helicopter and he's like first goddamn week of winter. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like <laughs> John, those John are Carpenter regular. really knew how to do those, those horror movies. But you know, man. what's so funny though, like that movie got crushed when it came out. I remember I was old enough. That came out, I think at 82, 83 ish. It got hammered at the box office. Critics hated it. And now it's same with like Blade, the first Blade Runner. I went to see Blade Runner with one of my best friends. And we were there's like ten other people in the movie theater, and I remember watching that, going, I was just completely, completely blown away by it. But it didn't do well because there was a different, 
other movies were coming out, like E.T. was coming out and some other things. And I think people maybe weren't ready for that kind of for that kind of vibe. But um, again, I, I know I've said I've gotten way off the track of military movies. But I think um, I, I think the biggest thing I would say is more importantly than the guns or the tactics is if you get the guy, if you get the people right and you get the people right by good writing and you get to be a good writer by not trying to shoehorn your bullshit onto it just by looking at it for what it is and seeing what that conflict is and what are those guys trying to, what are they trying to achieve and what are they willing to, what are they willing to do to achieve it? Are they willing to sacrifice themselves? Are they going to sacrifice someone else? I don't know. That's the thing. That's why, that's why any movie that has that, you know, cause we like, do we love, I mean, again, no one in the military is monolithic, but we love, we love the, the cartoony ones too. Cause they're fun because again, it highlights either something we want to be or something we know we are or that we, we, we value. And you were saying something funny in one of your things about, you know, and these action heroes, uh, you know, and they, and they look cool doing it. Can I tell you, that's so, that's so true. Like my <laughs> friend, we want it because we, we acknowledge that when you look cool, that's kind of a good thing. That means you kind of got your shit together. So like there's a couple times, like I'd be getting ready to jump out of a plane and I'd be looking up and I, and I, I have a helmet on, but I look at my friend and go, "How's my hair? Am I looking?" Yeah, right? it's like I, I want to. I want to do this like the action heroes would do it. You know? <laughs> yeah. How's my hair? Do I look? Do I look cool? Or like one of my my first squad leader? We were in the Gulf War. We were doing some training thing, and he was creeping over a dune like and taking an azimuth with a compass, which had a mirror on it. And I was laying next to him. We were looking, and he looks at the mirror, and he looks at he looks at himself in the mirror. He looks at me. He goes, "Still looking good." Yeah, <laughs> I'm there, dude. That was like that was like how many years ago? Thirty plus years ago, and I still remember as if I was there because it was fucking funny. He's like still yeah. looking. There's, there's something to be this, said for, for looking cool when shit's going bad. Well, this is the, this is the, I guess what I was going to touch on as well. Like some of my favorite movies are the most ridiculous, like Commando. I, I did a, a live stream talking about that. Like Arnie striding about shirtless, one hand in a belt fed machine gun and just uh -huh. like mowing down people, not like no facial expression. It's just yeah. cool as fuck. It's yeah. completely ridiculous, but it doesn't matter because it's that kind of movie. You know? Yeah, we embrace that. Like we're not sitting there going, you know, you're not going to be able to shoot a minigun standing up or blah. Like we test that actually. Yeah. Hollywood. We tested Predator. We actually, we did that. You, you couldn't shoot a live minigun. You just you lose control of it. So we, I had the blanks. We had the whole thing like Jesse Ventura, and then we actually mounted on a tripod with real bullets, and we built a jungle, and we see we wanted to see if you could cut down trees with that. So yeah, it was it was a but yeah, we we want to be entertained, and if there's even if it's not realistic, if there's an undercurrent of truth to it about like something we believe in or something we aspire to be, it will be a movie that we can embrace and we can dig. I should. I wanted to ask you as well because there's there's super chats as well that I was going to answer um, if you've got a little bit of time. But I have to ask. Yeah, you, dude. I, I, what's your favorite gun from any movie? Like, if you could pick one, what would it be? Because you must have seen a ton of them in your time. Yeah, you're gonna laugh. So I, I, you know, I grew up in the army with the Beretta 92F. Yep. Which is which is, and now we, we've got we've moved into Glocks, and now now the army has picked up the Sig. Uh, M17. It's the I have the I have the P3 uh, P360. It's a great gun. But but um, I think I always like the Beretta now because you know I remember. remember oh, there he is. Hey, Shake it back there. It does stuff. Look. <laughs> hey, Smokey. He's, how's it going, man? Smokey's like uh, I'm gonna just get my blood on this side, and I might I might have to take a dump in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's a handsome devil. Yeah, my guys are. I'm actually pretty excited because. Because Fat Larry hasn't moved back yet. Oh. He's, I got I got that dog a week uh, a week after my father died a couple years ago. I moved in with my parents and helped take care of my dad. It was awful, but and I, all these other senior dogs while I was taking care of him, I lost them from cancer and stuff. So I ended up getting him a week after Pop died. I've had him for two years, and he's attached. Completely untrained, don't care. He has the run of the house, don't care. He has you know he owns a joint, but guns, yeah. So I think. Um, I think uh, I think I was like I like seeing the Beretta because do you remember that was like in the first Lethal Weapon we tested Lethal mm. Weapon which was fun man we tested a bunch of Lethal Weapon shit but and I had to shoot the I, they wanted me to try to shoot the smiley face like Riggs did in the first one yeah uh, yeah which is not 
I hit I hit all headshots, but I was not able to do a smiley face. Mm. Uh, but like that gun, that was like, you know, that was like the cool gun when it came out back when he was using it. And we've had it for a long time. And I don't know, maybe I'm nostalgic that I also a bit, I also love the Thompson submachine gun. I used it in my show Warriors. And then we tested we did an episode on Holly Weapons called D-Day from the air. We tested like, you know, stuff for like the longest day. So I actually they brought me up like 100 feet in the air, 120 feet on this thing that could just make me descend at a, a static line parachute speed. And I had a live Thompson and I had to engage steel targets on the ground as I was coming down. And that was cool, man. That was really fun. I just, I like the submachine guns and stuff like that too. You know? Yeah. No, I, the Thompson was great. Like, uh, especially if you had the big drum magazine, you've got like, you know, 200 rounds to play with or something. It's like, damn, you can just keep holding down the trigger until something's dead. Drinker. We used to be a proper country here in the United States because back in the twenties, you could buy a Thompson at the at the hardware store, and and all and and so and and Coca Cola had cocaine in it. That look what they took what, from what us. What more can you ask for? <laughs> what, I mean, like, look, we were a proper country. You could buy any kind of gun back then, and it's like ah, now now you now you can't have a Thompson now. I guess you could. It's interesting. But yeah. You mentioned the Beretta though over the Glock because I've shot both of them, and I definitely prefer the Beretta, and it's because it's got a bit of weight to it. I hate the Glock because it's so light, and because it's so light, it jumps around every time you fire it. Like, I always felt that Beretta holds itself down a little bit more just because of the weight of the thing, you know? Well, there's something to be said for that. My, my SIG that I have is a, it's a, it's a, it's a X5 Legion, and it's got a sort of titanium, uh, a titanium frame, so it's heavy. It's a super heavy 9 mil, and it, that's a tack driver. Uh, the, the reason I like the Beretta is because I really – that was my first pistol – when I went into special forces and I'm a lefty. So like there was no ambidextrous stuff on it. So when I would shoot mm. it, I'd have to break to change. Like if I had to change the mag, I'd have to break my grip, drop the mag and get it in. And I got, you know, I, I trained constantly with that gun. So I, I got as fast as anybody else with it, even having to manipulate around my hand. And it was a pretty damn reliable gun. We shot a lot of rounds out of that. The only thing we had problems with sometimes we break the locking block and that's just from constantly using it. Mm. But it was just one of those guns that I, I, you know, most of my career I had. And, you know, and when people talk about guns, like what's the best gun? I go, I don't know. The best gun is the one that you feels good in your hand and that you actually fucking train with. Cause you can collect yeah. a million guns, but that's a nice car. That's a nice car, but can you drive it? That's the question. You know. <laughs> the the worst gun I've ever fired was the AK forty seven without a doubt. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. It's like you every like it, you did like it. It's a, it's a bit of a bit of a beast. It's just it's so powerful. Every time you squeeze the trigger, I, I actually felt the fucking pressure wave go over me, like with each round because it's that much of a blast off it. And yeah. like the last I probably the last fifteen rounds in the mag I said, fuck it, I'll just hold it down and see what happens. Like Full <laughs> couldn't yeah couldn't hold it like even like all putting as much strength as i could to holding it down it just goes up like that like yeah, you can't you, fire it in full you, auto. yeah if you do it a lot you you can lean your body into it but it's a 762 bullet is gonna that's a lot of ass behind that thing too yeah. you know when i was i went to i was an old guy i went to the special forces sniper course in 2010 as an old dude because our unit we had a slot came down and no one could go and it was like a nine week I, so I don't consider myself a sniper. I've been <laughs> one of the best sniper in the world, but like I, I was like, I was dog paddling through that course, man. I was always a better like assault or CQB guy, but like, you know, that was another world too. Like that, the sniper world has changed a lot. In, in that, you know, years years ago, you when you get to that when you go to a sniper course, you do you, you'd be spending so much time on the range at different at different. Um, uh, at different distances and then you would actually record all the atmospherics and all these other things and you would have a dope like a dope book meaning data on previous engagements so you would actually mm. go in and go okay if it's this temperature and this humidity this might be my hold or something like that now i mean you still got to learn that stuff but now we have these these different ballistic computers that have changed everything so like when we were teaching it before i got out you know we take a guy who was you know a special forces guy but he had no no time behind a long gun Within a couple of days, we've had them zeroed and they're hitting like thousand meter targets because it's, you know, you still have to use good. You can be a shitty shooter. That's the other thing. The gun's not going to shoot itself. So all those fundamentals yeah. of trigger, trigger squeeze and, you know, cheek weld and constant, you know, the sniper thing, you have to, everything you do has to be very consistent because then you're going to know what adjustments you need to make. But like, 
now we can plug in we can plug in atmospheric data to the computer we can plug in the height over bore we can plug in the round and you may even if it's a super long crazy shot you put in the coriolis effect because the earth is rotating yeah. i mean it's crazy shit and what my, my point is though it doesn't eliminate you know your ability to you have to have good basic fundamentals but the ability the learning curve has changed to where guys can get pretty damn good pretty quick and the scopes have changed too. the reticles and stuff are you can now you can even almost spot yourself you shoot it and you, it's over here move the reticle and boom off you go take another shot so things have changed quite a bit but it's still you're still in, in the in the real world out there it, you're still doing it in austere conditions you know you're not at a range where you're take a lunch break you know you may be you may be in a spot for a long time so all those other things that we that we have to take care of like camouflage and being in a hide site or just again deprivation hot cold hungry whatever that doesn't go away and you don't you don't get that you can't simulate that you've got to actually live through that so you can again it's not the first time you've been there yeah I so mean, it's, I, it's been an interesting time in in the military as far as some of those weapons systems even though yeah. the tactical lights we have when i went through the the it was called safar tech it was a it was the, basically the CQB assaulter course when I first got to Special Forces. We were using M4s with a big mag light, cop flashlight, hose clamped on the bottom with an aim point on top. And now we have all these sexy, you know, sexy stuff. We do a lot of stuff at night. So you're using nods, you know, night stuff with like lasers, infrared lasers. I mean, it's thermals. Thermals now are thermals. Are, you can't hide from a thermal. Mm. <laughs> you, can't, you can't hide from a thermal, dude. Your body gives off heat. It's so it's. The technology's come a long way, um, but still, it really is has to do with a guy on the ground, in in various kind of conditions. That you know, you still got to be that kind of guy. The tool is just a tool. I mean, they've made it easier to learn, I think, and more effective in many ways. But it's still a tool, a gun that has to be used by a dude who's done a lot of shooting, a lot of training, and has been through a lot of shit with it. And so that's never going to change. That's never going to change. There's always going to be a dude. It's got to have a guy on the ground with a gun. Yeah. It is what it is. It, it kind of seems like uh, with sniping, it's like a science and an art combined. You know, you've, you've got is. to take all the data in. You've got to like be able to process that, but you also have to just have that little bit of talent and an inclination towards it and all the. Training. Well, because you're using, you're using, you're basically all you're trying to do if you're taking a shot like that is to eliminate all sorts of other variables, right? So, yeah, and then also incorporate and understand math and physics. The sniper stuff was a challenge for me. I am not by nature a patient person. I'm just not. I was always a better like aggressive assaulter, you know, breaching the door and going in and controlled chaos and that kind of stuff. I think I was. I took. I had more. I liked that better. I feel like I, my personality was more of that. But the sniper course, like I said, I don't consider myself a sniper. There's so many good guys out there that could talk all day about it and have real experience using it. But the training was eye opening, and you know the stalking piece was was interesting because you're having to stalk on the instructors, and they know you're there. They know you're coming from this direction, so that's artificial, right? They, they're under like spotting scopes, and they're just waiting to see if there's any movement. They'll they'll come on a radio, and they'll have everybody freeze, and they'll walk an instructor and say, you know, walk him where he thinks you are, you know, sniper at your feet. And if you're at his feet, you're done. You pick up your shit and they, you failed that stock. So it's pretty high pressure and it's all under time. Um, but it was a great course because it actually did teach me some patience. It did teach me patience. And that was, again, that was something I wasn't comfortable with. And I, I hadn't had a lot of experience with bolt guns and long stuff. So that was, I was definitely out of my comfort zone. It was, it was as a team sergeant, it was a good thing to do because I, I understood better how to employ snipers and, and what we, what they could bring to the team. Hmm. No, it's incredible stuff. Like I can't imagine the the amount of dedication it must take to to become really good at that stuff. Uh, but we're still at the end of the day, though. We're just fucking kids with guns. Like we're just dumb dudes. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're just, dumb, yeah. I, I tell you, man. Like I did when I was in Tampa last time, like last year. I did like a little video on Twitter where I got to shoot a gun at a range. And I couldn't hide the smile from my face. Like, I was trying to be in character as the drinker. And I was like, it's just some fucking fun. <laughs> it's great. It is fun. <laughs> Blowing shit up is fun. Shooting guns is fun. Yeah. Uh, do, you like the state? do you like coming to the States? Uh, you, now, you live in the UK, right? Permanently. I mean, that's your base. But uh, do you like coming here? Oh, I love it. Absolutely. Love you it. do. Every time I come there, it's just, uh, it's been fantastic. You know, I was there um, for a convention, like, um, as an appearance as, like, as the drinker. Uh, back in July, and then I was in New York and Washington. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember that. I remember. Re I remember seeing that on your thing. But you like it here. It's it's a good place oh, to yeah. visit. It's great. You know, it's such can a I tell you, Scott? Place. Can I tell you? A, can I tell you a Scotland story when I first time I went there? 
You can indeed, yeah. I love America's okay. point of view on Scotland. It's great. Oh, no, it was fucking gold, man. So I ended up getting my first TV series I got was Warriors. And they actually, the History Channel called it Warriors with Terry Shepard. I argued with them. I was like, why are you calling it Warriors with Terry Shepard? Nobody knows who I am or gives a shit who I am. Just, I wanted to call it warrior culture because that's what we were, that was the goal, you know. Uh, but anyway, they, they kept it Warriors with Terry Shepard. So, okay. But our pilot, we did, we flew to Scotland. We, so the show was basically about a certain warrior culture. And we talked about their weapons, their technology, uh, the kind of guys that were there. We also highlighted a famous battle and also a hero from that from that culture. So our pilot was uh, the Scottish Highland Wars and William Wallace and the Battle mm -hmm. of Stirling. So we flew to Scotland and it was it was great, man. And 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 uh, it was funny. You remember the movie Gladiator, of course, right? Yeah. So remember the opening scene where that big barbarian with a black beard is in the middle and he's like, oh, he's like yeah. standing there. <laughs> yeah. That, by the way, that's a Scottish guy. That guy's name is Charlie Allen and he's a, like, a <laughs> weapons guy. And I ended up going and meeting him and his group of guys who have all these medieval weapons skills. And he was a he was a scary dude. He's super nice guy. And, you know, we got along great because, like, you know, it was it was Scotland. So what does that mean? It was fucking raining every day. And then. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. And I was walking along improv. I was walking along on some like causeway and I was like, this is Scotland. It's cold, it's raining, and it never stops. This is the kind of place that, I can't remember exactly what I said, this is the kind of place that tempers a man, makes him hard, and really pisses him off. And it was like, it was raining, and I, and, and the, the production team was like, get in the van. And, you know, Charlie and his guys were standing outside. I said, nope, if, I'm not, if they're getting wet, I'm getting wet. And we got along great. And it was funny because the one guy was like, he was talking about golf. He goes, golf. It's an excuse to wear shite trousers. <laughs> Everything they said made me laugh because Charlie and his group were like they were kind of they're Scottish nationalists, you know, like and, and they were their their thing was like we need to get kids from Scotland plugged back into their heritage and their culture because I guess you know a lot of a lot of drugs and you know people shit going off the rails there. Mm. And they have they had like a traditional music group called Black Bull. It was all medieval music. And another guy I met mm. His name was David Ross. He, he died a few years ago. He was a historian and he wrote a book about uh, he, he, a book. He wrote it around on his motorcycle to all these different places that William Wallace had been. And uh, he was one of the guys that I was interviewing. I spent a lot of time with him. Oh, the first day I meet this guy, it's it was raining. Right. And uh, and he comes walking out and I'm like, what is wrong with this dude? He's a big, tall, blonde guy. And he's got clearly he's got a bunch of makeup on. I can see like a bunch of black and blue underneath, you know. And I was like, what happened, David? He, he was, he's like, yeah, I got in a bar fight. And some guy like hit him with a tire iron. And then you see it. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a typical fight in Scotland. Yeah, because he was always like, you know, Terry, if you go to the pubs, you know, just be ready for guys to come up to you and go square goals. Because it's Scotland. Everybody wants to fight you. And yeah. I remember we, we were driving. He took me in his car. And we were driving. Such a, such a great dude. And I was like, I saw those little Scottish, uh, the wet Highland Terriers or whatever. I said, what are those dogs like? He goes, they're wee angry little dogs. Always <laughs> snapping like, and I, by the way, forgive my Scottish accent, but we laugh that we, they're wee angry little dogs. I couldn't stop laughing. Those guys were the nicest guys. And I, and I really, you know, we, I also went to a place, um, an Island, uh, this guy was hand forging swords. He used to be. He was like the lead singer. I don't say the descendants, a punk band. Fuck, shame on me. And he was living up there by himself in a forge, making hand making medieval weapons. And he was, he had me working in the forge, and and he was like showing me how to how to hit the steel. And he goes, the steel remembers everything you do to it. I was like, fuck, mm. that brilliant man. So that was like, and we finished the pilot, we put it together and history sat on it for like months. And I was going to go on a deployment to Afghanistan. And I was like, I'm leaving if you guys don't want to do the series. And then like literally like the last minute they called, yeah, we're going to, we greenlit the series. But Scotland's where it jumped off and it was really great to meet them. It was, it was a cool, uh, it was a cool thing. And there was a dude who worked at Sterling Castle who was a reenactor. I forget his name now, shame on me. He was joking too. He's a big, big barrel chested belly guy and he goes yeah some people say the body's a temple mine's a cathedral and he was we were doing all sorts of <laughs> sport fighting shit. years later my ex-wife's uh, uncle had gone they went to scotland and they visited sterling castle and they were talking to a guy there and they said
said, you know, our nephew was here a few years ago. He did a show called Words. He remembered me and he was like, dude, we had such a good time with him. So oh, nice. it's great. It's, it's a cool, where are you from in Scotland? Where, where part are you from? So I'm, I'm just near Edinburgh. So not that ah. far away from Sterling and all that stuff. Like I'm yeah, in the we, central I wish belt. I could have had time in Edinburgh. I wanted to really, it looks like a great, looks like a great town. We were, once we got to Sterling, we were in the kind of in the country area after that. And we, we never got to do any, any city stuff, but it's a, it's a, it's a cool place, man. And, and you know, the Scottish contribution to Western society cannot be, cannot be, uh, cannot be undersold, cannot be underestimated. We can claim that we invented TV, so that's like a little thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, so fuck, so fuck you, drinker. It's your yeah. fault. It's our fault that all this stuff happens. Believe that. Yeah. <laughs> and we invented whiskey, so yeah, you're yeah. welcome, world. Yeah. <laughs> we have you to blame. Yeah. Um, but hey, I've got a few super chats that are here for both of us, so um, if yeah, I throw guess... it on. Yeah, I'll see what we've got here. So the first one here is from RRTNZ. He says, Hail Drinker and Terry. Uh, question for Terry. In your opinion, what's the most realistic film or TV depiction of unarmed uh, close quarters combat with special forces operators? Thanks. Ooh, damn. Unarmed stuff, huh? Yeah, just close quarters stuff. You know what was pretty good? You know what was pretty good? And I saw it recently. Uh, extraction. That was, that was pretty good. I liked Extraction, yeah. That just was pretty, pretty, good. pretty simple, uncomplicated film, just action. Yeah, you know? yeah, and and there was that scene where he goes in and he starts stitching these guys up, and he like throws a tie kick on the guy's leg, which drops him, and then they're grappling, and you know the whole thing was he keeps getting to his gun, which is really smart because that's the thing, you know, like yeah, it's, I'm glad you're a jujitsu guy or a muay thai guy, but get to the gun, you know. So he like always getting to the gun and then shooting guys and then. Someone would tie him up, and he'd get free, and bubble boom, and he'd shoot them. I thought that was what I saw. That was pretty good. Again, yeah, it was a really good. It's they didn't need to embellish it. It was cool because he was also again, kind of a jaded, world weary kind of dude, and you know, then he has to make a decision about you know, sack, you know, going, you know, doing the right thing for this kid, mm -hmm. and he didn't have to do that, but he did. So again, and you don't have to spell it out. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to emote about it. He just. He just did it. So I, I thought, I, if I remember right, that was some pretty good, like, unarmed stuff. I'm going to have to think about that as far as unarmed stuff because it's, you know. I mean, it helped that Hemsworth, he, like, he's a big dude and he can kind of sell these, like, really physical moments. Yeah, like, he's and, really you know, like, fight. I saw, I, he, he threw a really good, I was a, I'm a shitty Muay Thai guy, but I, I, I like that art because it's very direct and it's, and it's you know, it's brutal and it's, it's you know, it's not flashy. He threw a really nice tie kick on this guy's thigh, which just dropped him, which would happen if you did it right. And then he just, you know, then he then he did some, he grappled with him, he choked him out. And, and I was like, yeah, that was cool. And it was all transitioning to guns up. Like Keanu Reeves did great. Now this is, you know, Keanu Reeves did a great job with that with John Wick. I remember when the first one came out, one of the guys in my unit called me and goes, man, you got to see this. Because we're all into that stuff. We're all doing combatives and guns. And I was, you could tell that Keanu Reeves had put in the time. He put, I mean, it's a cartoon. I get it. It's and all that. And it's whatever he, I think he killed like 800,000 people in it, but, <laughs> yeah. it was, but like you could tell that's a dude, they didn't, that wasn't done with like, you know, one thing I don't like to see is like when they try to make someone an action hero when they're clearly, they clearly haven't put in the time, you know, with, they, they do it with jump cuts and they cheat with the, with the cameras. And I just, that that's distracting to me. I would just, you know, like with counter Reeves, he, his transitions from like, you know, getting guys into a choke or then arm and then getting to the gun i was like dude that that's a dude who's put in and i think he competes in three guns so he's and by all accounts yeah, he's a very nice guy yeah i mean there's there's really great videos of him on the range where he's he's like making his way through targets and stuff and he's got like uh he's got like the assault rifle over the shoulder and sidearm and he can switch between the two like really quickly is, is yeah really we happens. have to do that we we're always doing transition drills with like going from your carbine to the pistol. And, you know, you want to get that carbine back up if you can three gun. They also use shotguns. So he's, that's a dude who put in the time and it obviously shows when you see it. So that was kind of, that was a cool part of that uh, part of that stuff. Yep. Give me uh, another next, one. Yeah. The next one is, I think this is for me. It's from Zach Luna who says drinker. Have you seen last of us yet? I watched it last night and I actually thought it was a very good ad adaptation with its own flavor. Good stuff. I've, I've heard, 
I've heard pretty good things about it so far, so I'm excited to watch it. I didn't know what to expect, like, leading up to this, but uh, I like the games, and uh, man, it'd be great if they could do a good adaptation, so looking forward to watching it. Um, Rune says, North Carolina, sorry, North Carolina represent Fort Bragg, I assume. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there we go. I don't live in the, I don't live in Fort Bragg. I don't live down there. I live in the Outer Banks. So right behind me, right behind me is the ocean. So, but you know, that's I spent a lot of time at Fort Bragg. That is the that is the epicenter of wannabe and real badasses. You know, that's where so much is there. Nice. Uh, next one is Canon Folderov says Hollywood drinker back at it. Great guest and great conversation. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's oh, been awesome thank you, man. You on. I, I was I was so excited to talk to you, and I was like, man, I I don't really have a huge body of like, I haven't seen probably all the movies that a lot of people have seen. I just I just wanted to talk to you about what kind of movies speak to dudes like us. And when I saw your video the other day about the destruction of these tropes, like the destruction of the stoicism, the destruction of you know the intelligent guy, you know, a, a problem solver, and and you know the deconstructing of a hero, I was like. These are the kind of things that we that we value in our world. It, even even and even if it's not necessarily realistic, it can be something that we aspire to. That we can we go, man. I I I, I like that, and it talks to maybe a deeper thing. So anyway, that's why I was excited to talk to you. I was like, man, I, there's probably a lot of movies people can tell me about that I have not seen. You know, trust me, man. That's like every time I do a live stream, there'll always be super chats saying, "What did you think of this movie?" And it's like something I've never heard of before, and it's it sucks, but like it's just fact of life. Hey, nobody. You can only see have so everything. much time, dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No one can see every movie. Um, Matthew A says, "I just wanted to say thank you, Terry. Uh, your Warriors show was what got me into history and World War Two. I love the raid on." Um, Cabanatuan Cabanatuan episode uh, about the Alamo Scouts and the Six Rangers thank you for starting my love of history my man that is that is flattering Uh, quick story about that that was the last we were really crushed because we only did one season and history at that point we were I think a victim of bad timing and that history channel at that point was rolling into cheaper shows to make see Warriors was an expensive show we were all over the world so I was I was in South Africa <laughs> living with Zulus. I was in Norway. We did Vikings. We were in Guatemala. We did uh, Mayans and 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 we went to Japan and did an episode about the samurai, which I wanted to put the uh, the the main uh, emphasis on Musashi and his kind of philosophy. But like it was the the the, the, the la- that was the last episode of the se- of this of the year of the season, and it was really great because the Alamo Scouts. Um, the, the, the movie The Great Raid uh, was about that, but it was it, it, it had good moments, but it, it, they tried to shoehorn a love story, which was just ridiculous. And I, it, there was no reason to do that. But it was a, they, the, 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 the the Alamo Scouts were a small recon unit that they stood up and the six Rangers. These guys went into enemy territory in the Philippines using Philippine guerrillas to get them through. They walked like 20 something miles. Through the through the Japanese positions, and they crawled on their bellies for like 400 yards to get to the spot where they could start engaging the. And the, the reason they did it was because there was intel coming back that the war was starting to close, and you know the Japanese were pouring gasoline on prisoners, and because these once a couple guys like got away and they got picked up on a boat, and they were like, dude, they're setting us on fire, destroying the evidence of all the cruelty. So they knew at Cabanatuan they had a lot of American POWs, and they're like, we got to get these guys out. And so the scouts, the Alamo scouts. And the Rangers and the Philippine guys, they they had this force. They 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 got through, they snuck in, they had they had a black widow plane fly over and distract the guards, which kept their eyes kind of looking up while these guys are crawling through the fucking grass. Like it wasn't high at all. Damn. Like they were just crawling their bellies. And then they engaged and they just we lost, I think they lost one or two Rangers. They they rescued like 450 guys. It was the most successful game. And it was quick story about that. I got to meet at the end of the, we were, we were kind of wrapping up. We filmed a lot of it in Florida. And all of a sudden I'm doing my clothes, what I thought was my clothes. And this Jeep, this little Willie's Jeep pops in behind me. And I, you could see my annoyance. So I'm like, who is this? Like, you're in my shot, man. And this Jeep rolls up with one of the produce, one of the authors that I was talking. And there's an old man sitting next to him. He goes, hey, Terry, I got someone I want you to meet. And it was it was one of the original Alamo Scouts, and Jesus. I I started crying. I hugged him. I said, "Do you know 
do you know what this means? Like, you're a hero. You're a, we grew up and he goes, you guys are, you guys are our heroes now. He was such an amazing guy. We were pulling out all these black and white pictures. He was a young stud. Here he is. He came back from the war, became the LA district attorney. His name was Bill Littlefield. He died a few years ago, sadly, but he just came back, built a whole life, LA, LA DA. And we had all this couple, the last, some of the last frames where he and I sit on a Jeep, just laughing talking to each other because I was like that really was such an emotional end because I was like man I really am part of something amazing that we stand on the shoulders of giants we really do so I'm glad thanks man I'm glad you like Warriors it was my first big TV show we wanted to do more but History Channel started doing things like Ice Road Truckers and Pawn Stars which are easy mm. you know when you have to have a team travel all over the world and hire experts I think that we just you know the ratings were good but they weren't good enough for them to justify that money so off you go. Warriors is done. So I'm glad, I'm glad he got that. Cause that was 2008. Dude, that was, Oh God damn. 14 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, eh? I had, yeah. I had more hair then too. More. Yeah. <laughs> the next one is from Cracklin who says, how do you feel about Avatar's depiction of the military? I'm an air force vet and that crap turned me off the first avatar. I hear that they're keeping that theme going in the second one. Yeah, I, I thought Avatar, I, I I haven't watched the second one. I saw your stuff on it. So once again, thank you for doing the heavy lifting so I can just go, fuck that, I'm not watching it. But I was bored. Uh, I, when I watched Avatar, after the first 15 or 20 minutes of feeling like vertigo from watching this these cool things, uh, I, was, I, I couldn't have been more bored with it because, again, it was one note, uh, James Cameron, I get it, you know, military bad, native people – good uh you know they're completely without sin without fault and i just thought it was you know that, that again not interesting I, I i thought avatar was was a fucking snooze fest sorry <laughs> yeah i'm not Which, even gonna uh, not even gonna argue with that <laughs> and, late, and, and also too and to your point about films it was an artistically lazy depiction of the military like i get it we you know it's, but it was just lazy it was like dude you, it could have been so much better but nope they didn't want to go that route you know yeah yeah it's just all, all about like scoring cheap points i suppose there was uh, a guy there was a dude one more thing on that so there was a dude i don't know if i want to say his name but he was uh, i worked with him on this contracting thing years ago and he was one of those original putting some putting some nicotine pouches in my in my gum so there was a he was a uh he was a he was a uh he was a lerp he was like a mac and then he was a mac v saw guy in Vietnam, just a legend in our community and he's part sioux indian and uh we were talking one time he goes it cracks me up how people think that american indians and he called them indians he didn't say native americans he goes american indians are these he goes they're humans he goes do you think if we had guns and steel and technology, we'd have fucking crushed Europe. If it, it just, he goes, it just is a different. He always thought that was funny that that somehow native people were held on a, a pedestal of, you know, more moral purity. The reason a lot of native, you know, American Indian tribes, it, there was a lot of land. So if you were getting pressure from another group, they most most of them, if they could, if they didn't fight them for these choice hunting grounds, they would just move and go somewhere else because there was room to do that. You know, then you have the Europeans coming over with all this excess population. People want to carve their fortune, and they had the technology. It developed in Western Europe and not, you know, North America or Central America. Or that it has nothing to do with what color you are. It's the way it rolled. So, so his his thing was like, it's such bullshit to you know because Indians torture each other. They were terrible to each other. Like, and it was just he goes, it's just so funny that the, that certain people put them on a pedestal of like they can do no wrong. He goes, trust me, we'd have, we'd have, we'd have murdered all of you if we could. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's like the real, yeah, the real history is obviously a lot more complex and it's just yes! like, yeah, that doesn't, yeah. doesn't get taught. Yeah. Um, Abel 34 Bravo says, Hey Terry, I used to watch you on the red eye back in the day. It's good to see you again as a fellow combat vet. I've always preferred your take on military matters over other so-called military experts. Thanks, man. Yeah, well, Greg Gutfeld. Uh, so I was doing Shark Week, and Discovery put me on Red Eye. This is in 2010, and I had seen Red Eye. As you know, this show uh, drinker, he was um, his name's Greg Gutfeld, and he was doing a show on Fox News called Red Eye with Greg Gutfeld, and it was on at three o'clock in the morning. We would tape it at nine, 
And it was just an excuse basically to hang out with different people and then go next door at Langan's Irish pub and drink afterwards. And the shit we used to say and do on this show was I, I, I would, for example, I, I was a guest because I was doing shark week. And then afterwards, Greg goes, man, you were great. You were around here. I go, yeah, bro. I live in New York. He goes, I'm going to get, I became a regular. The second time I went on red eye, Greg's like, Hey Terry, nice to have you back. I said, stop, stop. The only reason I came back on Greg is because you promised me a three-way with you and Bill Schultz. On Fox <laughs> I say this, and we all laughed. And the stuff we used to, uh, hang on a minute. What's going on, my dad? You oh, still there? I've lost you. I can hear you. I think, yeah, you're. I've no, lost I'm back. Your video. I'm back. I'm oh, yeah, back. yeah, you're fine. Yeah, you're good. So, so yeah, some, I thought I had muted my phone calls. So, anyway, man, so it was, it, he's one of those guys, and, and I remember talking to, I, we mean, you get to get drunk with, like, you know, authors and politicians. I won't drop names, but there was some pretty well-known people that were all hanging out and it was a good excuse to like party and have fun. And then, um, it was, it was, it was a really fun thing. I remember telling Gutfeld, I was like, we were drinking one night. We were the only two there. And he was like, I said, dude, one of these days Fox is going to figure out what they have with you. I said, first of all, how are we able to get away with this stuff we're doing now? He goes, cause no one's watching us. They had a really poor, core dedicated audience that would have their they had they had a whole like website and and all these things with all of us different guests and it was just a really weird small community it was so much fun and i said how are we getting away with this he goes because the headshed's not really paying attention they get good ratings yeah. but they're not paying. and then i said somewhere they're going to figure out what you have and then now he's become quite a star i actually have to get on the gut felt so he texted me the other day he goes when the fuck are you coming back up to new york i was like i've been ducking him because i don't you know not because I, I love him. I just don't feel like going to New York and it's just timing has been weird. But yeah, Fox News, uh, Gutfeld is a great guy. He's a, he's a very smart conservative guy who's killing. He's his show on Fox at 11 o'clock now on every night during the weekday. He's his ratings beat all the other late night shows combined. Nice. Uh, yeah. 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 The next one is a question for you from Matthew A who says, what was Dale Dye like? And what was it like meeting the Alamo scout? I think you talked about the Alamo Scout just there. I talked about the ago. Alamo Scout. I'll never forget it. It was a and Dale Dye was really great. You know, he was because he, he you know who he uh, is. You know who Dale Dye. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he started out as a military advisor, and then he started acting in movies as well. Like, it, I guess it was yeah. kind of part of his his deal. But uh, yeah, he fought in Vietnam and stuff, didn't he? He's he's got yeah, a big yeah, yeah. He was, a, he was a marine. He was a marine, and uh, he was really nice. He was he was a lot of fun. We had we had a lot of fun. I you know I was I was quite deferential to him because I he's he's a senior and he was you know, but he got along great and uh, he uh, <laughs> he called me one take Jake because I had to do these stand ups where I'm saying stuff and I get it and he would be like I'm gonna call it. He has this really deep military commander voice, but yeah. very gracious guy, really nice guy, legitimately nice guy. Yeah, I the, I think the first thing I ever saw him in was um, Platoon. Um, platoon probably yeah yeah. Platoon, um, platoon. yeah and he was great it's just like he really had the bearing oh, of you know it's a funny thing real quick about the military and this is platoon made me think of this it's a weird thing i don't know what it's like in the uk but here the american people's body of knowledge about military is really come from film and tv so even if it's wrong <clears throat> it's sort of been carried over into like well that's just common knowledge for example like Apocalypse Now, was it a great movie? I thought it was a great movie. Were, were, were guys, or Platoon, you know, were guys getting high on patrol? No, that wasn't good. They didn't do that. You, would, you wouldn't even think about, you wouldn't be on patrol smoking weed because you're going to get your friends killed. So I guess, and there's other things too that have been carried over as common knowledge, but it's not common knowledge from the Americans' experience with it. It's what they see on the screen. And that's an interesting thing. Mm. Some of that's been been changed now with military advisors coming back from like our war now. But th does that make sense? I feel like a lot of military knowledge or what they thought was the way it was, was really stuff that kept kept getting carried over from movies and TV shows. <laughs> and, it wasn't, and many times it wasn't based on actual experience or fact. No, I mean, I can totally get that because, you know, what's your influence on culture? It's like, it's the entertainment that you see. It's the movies, That's it's right. the TV shows. And rather than like, you know, how many people are actually going to, you know, read detailed um, historical accounts of this stuff? Not that many, but they'll they'll all go and see Not the latest action and, movie. Right. And also, you know, the, the, the amount of people in the military is a fraction 
fraction of our, of our population. And the amount of people in the combat military is this small. Yeah. So that, that body of knowledge, I was talking to one of my friends a while ago. We were talking about how in a way we're kind of going to be a lost generation because there wasn't a lot of guys who did what we did. And our stories are not as glamorous. It's it's easy and and right to talk to, to do World War II movies because the you know Nazis were bad and it was da da da. But like they're they're afraid to touch culturally the guys that we were fighting, and it's just not you know because again they're in many ways they're they're a protected class of people now, and so it's weird. Our body of knowledge, our common experience, because it's just a small amount of us that did the heavy lifting for so long. When we go those stories are gone. You know, in World War II, everybody had someone over there, an uncle, a brother, you know, maybe your mom was involved in the whack, but, and people were rationing tinfoil and butter and tires and buying war bonds. There was a collective American effort to do this. Now, and it's good and bad by design. We are in a military that's volunteer, so you, no one's gonna make you do it. And then because not so many people are involved, like for a lot of people, the war was just a news story. Unless you have someone over there, you come in for dinner and look on the news and like, ah, oh, we lost three guys mm-hmm. in Afghanistan. Okay, what's for dinner? There's no personal attachment to that because we have insulated the population from that and they haven't really had to sacrifice. I'm not complaining about that. It is what it is, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation where there's a, a distance of the population from that, from that blood and guts and that conflict because not that many people have done it, and it's it's been a concentrated effort by a small group of guys, and when we're gone, those stories are going to be gone. Yeah, it's, it's, and there was yeah. there was there was incredible heroism over there, man. Like, I mean, it, it felt like incredible heroism, incredible heroism. It felt like um, you know, right throughout the two thousands, that was very much at the forefront of. Um, of movies there was a lot of films about like the war on terror there was a lot of tv shows about it but it's like once you got into the 2010s that shifted and it's weird yep. it's almost like they wanted to forget that it was even happening and yet this, yeah. this thing was still rolling on and it was casualties were people were still coming home in body bags it was low level but it was always happening yeah um, but it was like yeah, i ran just the funeral. Move yeah i was i was in charge of the funeral for one of my friends man and you know it's it was in 2012 and it was, you know, and so it, it yeah, it's, it's weird. I, again, I'm not complaining, but it's a, it's a, there's might, there might be a societal price to pay for that down the road when the population has not had to sacrifice or deal with what that loss is. It's, it's theoretical to them. It's, it's intellectual. It's not visceral. We're like, I lost my boy. And so that's, and yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. No, I get you. And I guess. One of the things I was going to ask was like, you know, we obviously saw the withdrawal from Afghanistan and, oh. um, you know, what is it like a day later, the, the Taliban are in charge of Kabul and like they've got the whole country again. And it's like, that's 20 years of fighting for, for, for what, all. for what? And you know what Nothing. is, it's a, it's a bitter pill for me and my boys. We talk about this a lot. We have been lied to. We were lied to by our government, we were, we were lied to, and, and our military, the higher up, the, the a lot of the military leadership, you know, the Pentagon Papers thing, they didn't tell President Bush, Obama, or Trump, really the the, the actual ground truth because they wanted to protect their careers or they, they did this and it was da 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 da. There wasn't an objective, there, a lot, and the guys who would try to do that would be sort of ushered out. And so you have a lot of careerists that we're not being honest about what dude, our secretary of defense was a, was a, was on the board of Raytheon. Don't you think that's a conflict of interest? I don't know. Yeah. It seems like a conflict of interest. So the political piece is that, you know, I, by the way, still don't regret what I did. And, you know, a society should, should do well to find a place for guys like us because another dirty secret, not a dirty secret. It's just true. If you're in the combat military, you have to admit, we will tell you, we like the violence. We love the violence. Like we are, we take pride in planning, training for, conducting, and executing high-quality violence. I'm serious. It's got quality violence because it's it's just that's just the challenge. We we want that. That's why guys guys a lot of guys chase deployments. They still stay in maybe longer than because they always want one more role, man. Because they, mm-hmm. they want to be with their guys and they want that challenge. And that's a good and bad thing. So 
the violence is part of it and a society that can find a role for that. But we've been we got lied to. We got lied to. And that's kind of a hard pill to swallow when you realize that your government really doesn't give a shit about you. They don't. I didn't do it for them. I did it for the you know, I did it for my boys. But still, it's there's a there's a weird vibe right now where people are like, well, they were, you know, they're happy to kick guys out for not getting a covid vaccine, you know, 18 years in. But, you know, and and a lot the, a lot of the morale is not so great with all the gender bullshit, the racial bullshit, the careerism. We're really we're, we're going to be facing it. We're going to we have mm. some we have some interesting times ahead of us. You know, I don't yeah, want to say like, UK. you know. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much as bad over here. I, mean, I think I, it's probably I, about I think it's probably about the same. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I saw this this commercial that the military were doing. I think it was the army to try and get people signed up. And it was like it was in America and it was like this girl who like she's got two moms and she oh, likes to go to job. protests and stuff and i thought what are you doing the people that are going to get s- a- attracted by this you are not going to get people like that fighting a war <laughs> like, are you going to get that 19 year old watching tv wondering what to do with his life when he sees you know i am a, i am army strong and yet people wonder why the seals had such a great recruitment well the navy commercials are like dun 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 yeah, like, like God smack guys rolling off a of zodiac, even though that's like this much of the navy. It was a really smart recruit, and but in the army, he's like, you know, look at us, we are a we have a diverse force. Shut up, it's so bad. It's and they yeah. spent so much money making those commercials, and they're awful. They're not, you're not appealing to the young, young studs that like want to really be tested, and so yeah, it's pretty bad. It's it's actually embarrassingly bad. It's it's a really strange mindset. Um, yes. It's- Chris Nicholson here, he says, fellow vet here, some people may like to dismiss these reviews as just complaining about movies. In reality, our culture is a statement about what we value and what we aspire to. Wanting yes. culture to be better is important. I, I Yeah, I agree. That's, I agree. Uh, 100% right. He's right. He's absolutely right. He's absolutely we get asked about 100%. this a lot. You know, why do you, why do you review these like, you know, mainstream Hollywood movies that are just there to make money and it's like well people watch them and they influence a lot of people so if they're garbage then you know that's going to have a bad influence on the culture yeah um hobo chili recipe says a gentleman salute uh first off i was uh, a pog but at least i uh, learned how to talk to helicopters my battle buddy was an aerosol instructor and he says the new soldiers are built so soft too many profiles yep that's true yeah, but I was telling you before, like there's there's a weird, you know, obviously in our in, in, in our community that that, you know, we, we, we select guys and push guys. But even then, some of that's crept in. There was some scandals a few years ago about, you know, SWIC and Special Warfare Center instructors saying we are being told not to lean heavy on these guys where, you know, they have an open door to the commander. I'm being, you know, persecuted by this uh, cadre member and um yeah, it's supposed to be hard. If it's not hard, we're we're not set. You put away, you know. If, if we don't make it hard, we're not doing you. We're not helping you. We're actually setting you up for failure. And failure can mean death. Well, that's that's the ultimate thing, isn't it? Because it's like not only could this person get themselves killed, they might get a bunch of their buddies killed as well. And, and that's like, the worst. That's the worst. Yeah, because it's like that's I have to go back to their parents and tell them, like, yeah, they all got killed because like I had to pass this person through basic training that totally wasn't up for it, but like I, I did it anyway. And it's like it's on me now. Like that's yeah. you can't Bad. put that on someone. That's not fair. Nope. And they do, and they do, and we, we will we will pay for that. <laughs> we will pay for that. Um Dr. Scroob says, I'm either very drunk or is the title of this video an anagram of Terry Pratchett? <laughs> that's just <laughs> Shepard and Pratchett. Uh, there's a slight resemblance there. By the way, that picture that you posted too of me with the duck lips and holding my biceps out, my friends just take the piss out of me for that. So I just <laughs> I want to thank you, Drinker, for highlighting that awful, that awful like, Hollywood. I don't even know where that. I mean that, that they. I was like that. That looked like such a fucking uh, such a douche with that picture. It's funny. I, I just I, I wouldn't. Well, I'll tell you what. When I re-upload this, I won't use that as the thumbnail. I just did a Google image search. Oh, I don't give like, a shit, man. It's fine. I don't give a shit. It's <laughs> I, like I said, I have no ego. I'm an idiot. So the uh, yeah, I retweeted your thing, and my friends were like, uh, "Nice duck lips, Shepard." I was like, "I hate you." I hate you. <laughs> You're gonna abuse yeah. me no matter. What, and it's fine. It's fine. Goes with the territory, I suppose. It is. Uh, yeah, I'll take it. 
Marty Gray says, I remember basic. I lost my sense of taste. I was so exhausted. I ate a whole lemon meringue thinking that I was eating chicken tikka. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Okay. That sounds pretty, that sounds pretty bad. Uh, Abel 34 Bravo says, your take on women in the military is something that I've always agreed with. I had a hard time with them uh, the whole time I was in. Always had to carry their stuff for them, set up their tents, even drive their vehicles for them. Damn. That's, uh, that's, that's, such, rough. that's such an argument. There was, um, they've put, uh, they got a couple gals through Ranger School and then, but there's, uh, there's some talk about how they were given a little bit of special consideration, like being able to recycle something or you know because a commander is like i want to be a commander is like i want to be the guy who could put on my you know officer evaluation report that i got the first woman through ranger school and uh you know same thing with the q course and stuff like that too i think the i don't know man i my initial thing is like you know guys are guys and uh there's always going to be sexual tension with if there's girls in the mix and i i just don't think i don't know i don't want i would want that distraction down range i think there's a place for them especially if you're doing plain clothes, if you're doing like sort of like Intel stuff, like, you know, in World War II, they had women that doing, doing some, they were doing some badass stuff. But I think to have a, a female on a 12 man, 18, that's down range. I mean, you know, what do you get? There's no, we're shitting in front of each other. You know, it's an yeah. awesome place. If you want to see me, it's a great place. If you want to see naked dudes. Honestly, it's awesome. <laughs> but like, I just feel like, and who doesn't, but I mean, it's, you know, I think it, that that I always thought that would be a distraction. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I can. I, I know that, that I'm uh, out now. So a couple, a couple of my friends, like one was in the RAF, one was in the the army. He ended up going into um, like an armored division, like driving tanks and stuff. But like they both described the same thing, where they were going through training, um, and quite often you'd get sent on these like navigation exercises, where it's like you've got to hike across ten miles of open country and yeah. do a bunch of obstacles and stuff. And you get split up into squads, like maybe four or five guys, and you've got to work together as a team. The whole point is to like teach you to to work together. Um, and they they always said like everyone prayed that they didn't get one of the girls in their squad because like it, you meant you were guaranteed to come in last. You had to help them over things like they couldn't carry the same weight that everyone else could. They couldn't get themselves over obstacles, and they just became like a total liability for the squad. But you couldn't get rid of them, and you couldn't complain about it. So they were stuck with them. Uh, there are, are just... yeah. There, there are there women out there that are physically tougher than a lot of guys. Hundred percent. I mean, you can look at some of those CrossFit athletes. Those chicks are jacked, and and you know, and and there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. That's not the question. The question is, I look at it this way: when I was a, when I, especially when I was a team sergeant, you always have to think to yourself: there's two things you want to increase and that you care about more than anything for your team how to increase lethality and how to increase survivability and if something doesn't yield directly <coughs> to the increase of those then it is a distraction and it's not i don't want to be distracted so that's that that's always been my take on that if it's if it's going to get in the way or we, or we have to make a special accommodations or something like that and they, they've been goofing around with like the, the physical fitness test where they're dropping standards because blah, blah, blah. No, and it's just don't do yeah. it. We're so, yeah, it's like they're there guys, for a reason. And, like that's the whole yeah, point. And, then, and we are expendable. We're dudes. We're supposed to die like because we don't we can't make more human beings. We're, we, we're very replaceable. You know, women in a society are actually should be protected because without them, we're not going anywhere. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, it's a tough call. I mean, I've seen some great women pilots, you know, and stuff like mm. that. I, I, you know, but I haven't, you know, I was never in where we had a, you know, have a, a girl on a, on a, on an A team or in an infantry squad. I, I just don't know how that would work out. It just doesn't seem like it. Would, I don't know. I don't mm. know. Yeah. Well, it's a tough one. Um, Abel 34 Bravo says YouTube wouldn't le let me send hated and not men adjacent in a super chat. Uh, hail drinker. Keep up the good work, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, P. Bothlu says, Tolkien's writings were shaped by the terrors and horrors and tragedy of World War One. His faith was far more evolved than others of his group, such as C.S. Lewis. Tolkien saw an aged uh, die to be replaced with the sort of world that we see today. Yeah, I mean, he saw the dawn of industrialized warfare. 100% guess, right. So. And that's what, Sar that's what Saruman was. Remember, Saruman had a mind of machines. Yes, yeah. Uh, Tolkien hated industrialized cities and stuff he was very much like the countryside you know yep yep and he wanted uh, to preserve it 
Uh, Powder Toastman says, do you think guys, sorry, do you guys think HBO will do another war miniseries and which conflict would you like to see it set in? I think the Marines in World War One would be a really interesting idea. Um, so yeah, like if they were to do another Band of Brothers type thing, where would you like to see that set? I didn't, you know what I didn't see, shame on me. I've seen like one episode. I didn't see the Pacific. I heard it wasn't as good as Band of Brothers. Um, but I, I, it would be great. It would be great if they did something in this conflict. I just don't trust them to do it right. I just don't trust mm -hmm. them to do it right. And I don't, I just don't think there's people in that industry right now who could look at it objectively and tell that story without folding in all their bullshit. And that's sad. You know, that's sad. Um, Bullet Sponge 103 says Hail Drinker and Terry, have either of you heard of the band Sabaton, one of the best bands who tell the stories and tragedies of the soldiers and heroes who sacrificed for each other and for everyone else who may never know what they've done. I have heard of Sabaton I've heard of them too I'm going to go see them in April actually, they're playing in Glasgow so I'm looking forward to that Oh, hell yeah <laughs> uh, So yeah, that should be great uh, the, some of the tracks are amazing. Ghost Division, Bismarck, like yeah. It's good oh, stuff. okay. I'm, I, I haven't. I can't. I can't put their. But I, I've heard that. I've heard the name of that band. I didn't know that's what they were about. So I will look them up. They're they're really good. Good metal band. Um, and Heron of Alexandria says, "Love your show, Warriors, on the History Channel. When I was a teen, so cool to see worlds collide here." Uh, Excellent, man. I'm really glad people people who liked Warriors really liked it, and we were bummed that they didn't give us another season because we had all sorts of cool ideas coming in our pipeline of like warrior cultures that we were going to get into, and all of a sudden it was like, yeah, we're not going anymore with this. I was like, ah, bummed. Yeah, uh, it sucks when things you know they don't quite pan out or they don't get renewed or whatever. But so, yeah, it is what it is. Sorry, I was man. like, is it me? Did I suck? Because then you start thinking, maybe I sucked because, uh, you know, the idea of the show was great, but I was like, maybe I was a shitty host. You start you start thinking to yourself like, man, I don't know. I think I'd be better now in Warriors, even though I'm older and more banged up. I think I would be a better host than I was in 2008. I do. It's just, it's all money. It's, I guess, all it comes down to at the end of the day. It's all money. But, hey, you know, they could they can green light things like Velma, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh. It's just baffling. <laughs> I just oh, I, I I saw your little like sort of seven seven minute review. Of yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that. Got like made. I said, you're doing you're doing you and the boys like nerdrotic and and all of those and fucking Mahler and Disparu and all that as like honestly, you guys are doing the Lord's work because I do, I actually look forward to seeing what you guys say. You're, what you what you write is is so good because also I think your 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 ability as a writer to sort of be able to do that. Oh man, your shit is way more entertaining than anything they put out. So thank you, Drinker, for for your service. By the way, I know you're making this this movie. I know you talked to Matt. Did you ever see Matt Marsden? This is how we end up linking up. We were communicating on Twitter, and he sent me a movie that he wrote and directed and starred in called "I Am That Man." Did you ever see it? No, I don't think so. So you should you should talk to him about this because in his opinion, because we've talked about other projects and he goes, honestly, <laughs> because you don't get the return for doing a short film. He goes, he goes, you know, and they, he did the fundraising and they did it on a pretty low budget, but it was really well done. It was really well done. It was he got so much of our what happens to us when we come home, like the shit we have to deal with. It was a it was a really a good project. And. He did it on a shoestring budget, but he had some really good people in it too. Um, uh, you know, unknown actors, but they were really very talented people. And it was a it was a fucking good movie. And his his take is you can he goes the best thing to do is to do a feature feature movie, just raise more money and go with that. You should talk to him about that. And you should have he, him send. He, you yeah, he's he's been saying that to me. Um, I think the plan with this one, right, is that we do this as kind of a short, and I say short because it's going to be like forty five minutes long. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that shows, I guess, what we can do. And then we try to raise the funds. Springboard it. A, yeah, do like a feature film next year. Okay. You know, so because yeah. I want to give the production guys a chance to like get their teeth into this and show yeah. us what they can do uh, rather than say, right, now you've got to do like a full on feature film right off the bat. It's like quite a lot. To yeah, in, maybe. So. It's, I, I, don't, I get I get his I get what he's saying. You should talk. You should have him send a, a, a link to that movie. And I get it, you know, because I think I think also maybe this is the way forward and that, you know, if you put if you start making some good stuff, you know, will you ever be Warner Brothers? 
probably not. You don't have, but you can also take some other lunch from them. And you and yeah. they and you know, right now everybody said it can't be done. So if you start showing that there is a different way, drinker, it's you know what though? If you became like a big Hollywood producer, you would be so fucking insufferable. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, dude, you would be just you. you Dude, we couldn't even talk to you anymore. You'd be like, hey. I would, de- uh, I would demand I limousines from my greyhounds to take them around places, you know. As you should. <laughs> as you should. As you should. As you should. I would honestly just be happy to uh, to be able to say, like, well, like, you know, we, we managed to make a feature film of one of my books. You know, to see that thing that just started out as a tiny little idea in my head turned into yeah. an actual movie, that's an incredible yeah. thing to be able no, to do. No, we're all so. pulling for you, man. We're pulling for you, man. I think it's gonna. I think it's got great potential. Uh, but yeah we will see what happens but i mean yeah we're definitely working hard on it um good but uh yeah like i know we've been streaming for about three hours now so that's that's been an awesome talk that i've had with you man uh, like it's been an absolute pleasure having you on for this um and yeah I really appreciate you me, man. Up your, yeah no i appreciate you bringing me on i i i, I talk fast and i talk a lot but I, i'm a huge fan and i i'm not kidding when i say that uh I'm I'm not I'm not saying it just to say it. I think what you guys, you and the rest of those cats are doing is it's pretty important shit because you're 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 holding up something and saying this is it. And 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 by the way, the other thing is too, it's you, your shit is so entertaining. You you've got these things now, these words like you know the whole thing go away and ah uh, believe that and but also <laughs> yeah. that was like you always start them going. You know, sometimes I start thinking, you know, like, oh, and I, I go like this, dude. I go like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where is he going to go with this? And then sometimes dude, even I don't know. <laughs> no, I, but I, yeah, who cares? You get there at the end, right? And and the thing is, I, I think you, you know, I can, I hope, you, I know you're going to. It's actually pretty important work because culture is important, and we've been being fed lies and bullshit and being forced to like look at these things by people who really openly disdain us and they disdain our, what we believe in they disdain our culture i get it you don't have to believe what i believe but don't spit in my face and tell me that i have to accept it because i won't i'm just not going to yeah. do it and so the fact that you guys can do it in such an entertaining way oh my god i look for i do I'm, I'm on i'm on youtube all the time i just critical boom and there it is oh my god there's a new one. Here we go. Here we go. So keep that up. You know, good luck. And and thanks for letting me come on and run my mouth. I think, you know, for the same reason that anybody else likes movies, military guys like them the same way. It's got to be a good movie. There's got you. More importantly, you got to get the people right. You got to get the characters right. And you've got to. And it's it's not glorifying death or violence because there's nothing glory about it. Trust me. Uh, but it's there is glory. There is something really, really redeeming and hopeful in sacrificing for your friends there is some there is something worth looking at like doing something above yourself there is something beautiful in shared suffering towards a common goal and i think that's the kind of stuff that good war movies will hit you know and also yeah. sometimes just the, the highlighting of like how brutal the world is the world's a brutal place man you yeah. know but i appreciate you taking the time to talk to me man you you just gave, made me a lot of cool points with my friends, so thanks, drinker. <laughs> no, it's been awesome, man. And honestly, like I can see from the reactions in chat, like everyone's loved having you on. Like just the the experiences that you bring to this, and like your insights into how these things are done. Uh, oh, I appreciate awesome that. Yeah, it was. Man. You know, you have you have a loyal you have a loyal fan base for a good reason, and it hasn't happened overnight. You know, you've been putting out stuff for a long time. And you wouldn't have that fan base if you're if you were putting out shit. So you know, keep swinging the bat, and and I look forward to seeing you. Like I said, though, if you become a producer, you're just going to be so insufferable. Oh my god, <laughs> fuck! You'll have your own whiskey brand. You're going to be oh god. It's gonna Don't be worry, I'll never be that successful. So it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, man. Thanks again, my brother, and uh, I hope to talk to you again sometime. And uh, I can't wait to see what down the road what comes to you and uh, you know you've earned it, man. You've really done you've really done some great stuff, and it's it's just been a joy. You've opened up my eyes, like I said. You've been the gateway drug. All these other fucking jamokes that you hang out with and talk about, talk with, like you guys bring some really great. You, what's good about you, and I'll let you go after this. I I see what you see, but because of your ability as a writer, community, you articulated in a way that I'm like, yes, that's what it, I couldn't say it that way, but. 
Hmm. That's your gift is to be able to articulate it and to pick it apart and go, here's here's what's going on. So keep it up, man. No, thank you very much, man. And uh, yeah, dude, you should be on Open Bar or Friday Night Tights sometime. Like, I think any time, awesome, bro. Be fun, with, be fun with you. Oh, that bug, that that crowd. Oh my. Well, you just <laughs> let me know, man. I'll come on anytime. Nice one. All right. Well, thank you for everyone that's joined us tonight, and for all the amazing super chats. For any ones that I didn't quite get to, I will do a catch up stream to to uh, answer all of them as well. And uh, yeah, appreciate all of you. So thank you. And uh, well, for me and from Terry. That's all we've got for today. So go away now. Go away. Go away now. <laughs>